Game development is now more accessible than ever before, thanks to powerful game engines such as Unreal Engine being freely available to anyone to make their own games. But learning a huge piece of software like Unreal Engine can be really, really daunting, especially if it's your first time. But don't worry, I'm here to help you out. Welcome to Game Dev Academy, I'm Shane, and in this tutorial video, I'm going to show you how to create the game you can see on screen right now. Over the course of this project, you'll learn to use the Blueprint Visual Scripting language that makes game development so accessible in Unreal Engine, as well as how to include art assets, sound, how to use destructibles, physics, all manner of crazy stuff. So if that sounds good to you and you're ready to create your first game, then just hang on a sec and we'll get stuck in. Okay then, let's make a start on this project and the first place we need to be is in this new project area of Unreal Engine. Here it is and as always you've got the choice of the different types of projects you could choose but for this one because I want to really focus on doing everything ourselves we're going to start with a blank project so we've got no code waiting for us we're going to have to create everything ourselves. I also want to do something a little bit different, so we're not going to do desktop console for this one, we'll, we'll get it ready for mobile tablet. Because this is going to be, when it's finished, uh, have a touch input for it, then mobile or tablet is a good fit. We don't want maximum quality, we'll go scalable 3D or 2D, uh, again because we're aiming it at mobile platforms, better to keep the quality in check. And we're not going to have any starter content, you can bring that in later if you want to. There are ways of doing that, but for now we're going to go with no start content because it'll help to keep the package size down when we're finished. And then the last thing I'll do, which you need to do as well, is give the project a name and decide where you want to save it to. And I've decided to save mine into my shared files, so if you want to get access to the assets and to the project as I'm building it, you can use the link in the video description. And I'm calling mine Breakout Tutorial. And then we can create project. So when Unreal Engine opens up, you'll be greeted with this sort of default level that it creates for you. But as I want to make sure we're going to build everything ourselves, we're going to create a new level with nothing in it at all. So to do that, we'll go up to File. We're going to choose New Level. And we're going to do an empty level. There it is. And then the first thing I'm going to do is save this level into a Levels folder. So I'm going to right click in my content browser. I'm going to choose to make a new folder and I'm just going to call that levels and then I'm going to call this level so file save current as I'm going to put it in the levels folder and I'm just going to call it level one and we'll click on save the next thing I want to do as part of setting up is make it so that every time we open this project Unreal Engine will take us to this new level. We don't want to go back to that weird default one. We want it to know exactly which level it should open in. So that's what we'll do now. So in order to do that, we're going to go to Edit and Project Settings. And that opens this window here. And we need to click on the Maps and Modes section under Project. So you can see that by default, the Editor Startup Map is this template default, which we don't want. So we're going to Click on the drop down box there and there is our level one that we've saved. So we'll do that there. And then whenever we start the game, we want this one here, the game default map to be level one as well. So that means that now whenever we open the game or the editor, it will take us to the correct level. Okay, so now that that's done, we can close the project settings just for now. And the next thing I want to do to wrap up this step is to bring in and check the collisions on the meshes that we'll be using to get the first part of this exercise set up. So I'm just going to create a new folder for that. I will call it um, static meshes. I'm going to open that folder up and then we can choose to import. Okay, so at this stage you can bring in your own assets or you can use mine using the link in the description. So if we go to the shared folder that I'm working in, there is a breakout assets folder and there'll be more assets put in this as the tutorial uh, matures as it as we get further through it but for now we only need these four meshes so we get a ball a block what i'm calling bounds which is kind of what the the ball is going to bounce off as it goes through the, the play field and also a paddle which is the the thing at the bottom that knocks the ball around so we're going to import all of those so i'll click on open and then it's going to ask us some questions about them how would we like to import them 
So I'm going to let it auto generate collision, although there are collisions included, which so we'll have a look at that in a sec. The the import scale should be right, so I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, and what I don't want to do for this one, I don't want to really mess things up. I don't want to import the materials or the textures. When it comes to materials and textures, we'll create our own within Unreal Engine. So when that's done, we can just click on import all and it will do that for all four meshes with the same settings. Here we go. So you can see now we've got the ball, the block, the paddle and the game bounds as well. So what I want to do now finally is just make sure that the collisions are set up properly or if I'm not happy with them, I'll change them myself. So we'll start with the ball. So I'm gonna double click on this, and this opens it up in the static mesh editor. And for a game like this, as we're gonna set this prototype up, physics and collisions and getting it to bounce around, all that stuff's really important, so we need to get it right. So what I'll do is this collision thing here, we'll be using simple collision. You can't use complex collisions uh, for the type of thing we're doing. It has to be simple, so that's got to be right. And if we zoom in, you can see that this green thing here represents the collision. And while that's a good attempt, it's not good enough. So I'm going to put in uh, a new collision mesh for this one. So if I click on collision here, we can remove that collision because it's rubbish. And we're going to click on collision again and we're going to add a sphere simplified collision. And what's good about this is you can see it just fits perfectly. You can just see it poking out of the mesh a little bit. So that now will be perfect for what we need because it's the right shape and it fits the ball exactly. So we can click on save there. Now we just need to check the other three. So let's have a look at block. We'll turn on the simple collision. That's perfect. You can see that that fits exactly. So we'll save that and you'll notice we've got a little asterisk next to the file name and that's because it's not been saved yet. So we just need to click on save, that goes away. And then let's say the project crashes or something like that. When we reopen it, the asset will be there because it's now been saved. So let's check the game bounds. Um, okay. And we will just check the simple collision on those. And that's pretty good. So I've got a custom collision that I put on this. So it doesn't fit the outside exactly. You can see it just fits in here. And if we go over here, I did also try some funky stuff here, which I may take out. The one you download might not have that in it anymore um, because it's not necessary. But to get the collisions in the way I wanted it, I had to put custom collisions in like this. So that's working fine as long as you can see something like that, maybe without these cylinders though, because they're not necessarily needed. Um, but that one's okay. So we'll save that. And the final one should be working uh, is the paddle. Yep, and we can see that that collision mesh just fits that perfectly. So we can save all four of those and we'll close the static mesh editors. Goodbye, static mesh editors. Awesome. Okay, that brings us to the end of the first step. In the next step, what we'll be doing is setting up our inputs so we can control how the game is controlled. So we'll put some keyboard controls in just to get things up and running. We'll also be getting the screen size correct so that we've got um, kind of a mobile phone template so that everything works, we get the right orientation. And we'll also be setting up a game mode and having a look at what a game mode is because that's kind of important. The first thing we'll do in this step then is get the inputs set up for our project, which will allow us to interact with the game using the keyboard. So in order to do that, we need to go to edit and we're gonna go into the project settings first of all, which gives us this beautiful window here. And the place that we need to go to is just here, which is input. And the section we're concerned with at the moment is the action mappings and the axis mappings. So we'll start with the actions. And what we're gonna need is some way to get the ball to go into play in the first place. So we're gonna add an action mapping for this. We'll just drop that down. And the first thing we'll ask us to do is to give it a name. So I'm just gonna call it fire, since we'll be firing the ball. And then once I press enter to save that name, it asks me what key or keys I want to attach to that action. So in the first place, we're going to be going around the WASD keys. So I'm going to add the W key for this, which is just here. But then I want to add a couple more so that we can play the game in different ways. So I'm going to click the plus icon here. And I also want it so we can play on the arrow keys. So I'm going to add the up arrow key to that. So if we just go to search, and if we type up, 
there it is so we've got the up option there and just because it's a nice big key I think we'll add the space bar as well so we'll go plus one more time and if I start typing space there's space bar so now all three of these buttons will trigger the fire action we also need to be able to get the paddle to move left and right and in order to do that we're going to add an axis mapping so we'll click on plus again and we'll drop this down and I'm going to call this one horizontal movement yep I spelled it right well done so for this one we're going to have it on the A and D keys to go left and right so we're going to add the A key which will be in here somewhere there it is and we're also going to add the D key which is just there and then we're going to add the left arrow and the right arrow as well there it is so that's how we're going to control the paddle going side to side at the moment though we need to change these so D and right are okay because they're going to go to the the right which is correct but we we need a and left to do the opposite of that so instead of having one on the scale we're going to have minus one on both of those values so that's our action mapping set up the next thing we need to do is make sure that we are developing for kind of a, a phone screen sort of size so we can close the project settings for now and in order to get the phone screen sort of size we're going to go into the edit preferences and I'm going to go to play, this play section here. And here you can see you've got common window sizes. And within that you've got phones and lots of different phones you can choose. So most of these are quite high end. But because I want it to fit on screen quite easily, I'm just going to aim for the Samsung Galaxy S4. Which will be something like that. And to test that out, if we just go to play here and we go to a new editor window it will open this up and that gives us an idea of how our screen is going to look so that's kind of your standard um, Galaxy S4 screen but I actually want my screen size slightly different to that so instead of 360 by 640 I actually prefer 480 by 640 you can have either or it might just change how you set up your level so I'm happy with that you can if you want change between landscape and portrait using that button as well which is pretty useful um, but we're going to be doing it in portrait mode and the last thing I want to do for this step We can just close the editor preferences is to create a game mode uh, Which we'll not be using just yet, but it'll be ready for when we are so I'm going to go into my Content folder back up to the top. I'm going to create a new folder to keep it all organized and I'm going to call this my blueprints folder Okay, like that and within here, I'm going to create a new blueprint so I'm going to go right click a new blueprint class and I'm going to choose a game mode and the first thing I'll ask you to do is to give that game mode a name so I'm going to call it BO that's for breakout not body odor uh, BO game mode and you should notice that I'm not putting any spaces in any of my names I'm just capitalizing the first word as is the convention so that's set up and ready to go and what we want to do now is make sure that this is the game mode that's being used when the game starts and to get that to happen I'm just going to go save all you've got a little asterisk here so I'm just going to do save all to make sure that that's saved go into my world settings and you can see here there's this game mode override section and if I choose my new game mode from here BO game mode that will be set up and ready to go so that brings us to the end of what I wanted to cover in this step in the next one what we'll be doing is blocking out our level so we're going to put some of the blocks in we're going to put the ball in place and the paddle in place get an idea of scale get the bounds in so that we've got an idea going forward make sure it all fits within the phone screen as well so hopefully i'll see you in the next step for that ah hello again right in this step what we're going to do is get the level blocked out basically we'll create a simple material we'll get a camera in place so we've got an idea visually of how this is going to work so the first thing i'm going to do to get this layout is i'm going to change to uh from my perspective view to this top orthographic view uh, and orthographic views are great because they don't show perspective so they're really good for lining things up and you can see here is the center of my world 
known as the origin or 000, and what I'm going to do is go into my static meshes folder, and the paddle's kind of going to be the center of the world, the most important thing for me. So I'm going to drop that in here. I might need to just zoom in a touch. There we go, there's the paddle. And what I'll do to make sure that I get that to 000, zero, zero is I'm just going to use these properties here. So 0, 0, 0. And that's now in place. And what I'll do is line everything else up in relation to that. So we'll get the ball. And we're going to put that at 0 on X. And we're just going to move it up a little bit on Y. Looking nice. Then we'll get the, the game bounds in place. So I'm just going to throw that in and we're going to put it at 0 on X for now and 0 on Y. And then we're just going to move it over until it's kind of central. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So yeah, it's about 7 on either side. That's about central. So now I've got almost everything. The last thing we need is to get some blocks in place. So I'm just going to throw it in there. And let's just get it central, uh, like so. And then we're just going to move it up and get it into place. So let's take it up near the top. And I'm just going to put this one in the center about as high up as I want to go, which is about there. And then I'm going to duplicate these. And the easiest way to do this, or the fastest way, is if you hold Alt on your keyboard and then move it, it will actually create a copy of it and move it down. So we'll put that kind of gap in there. Uh, we'll repeat the gap again, and we'll do one more. We'll have four rows of them for now. And then what I want to do is duplicate these over, and I could just select all four like this by holding Shift and duplicate them all together, or a nifty little trick which I learned today is if you hold Shift and Alt, and then that'll give you a marquee selection, and you can select all four like that. And then what I'll do is I'll go like that and hold alt again as I copy and I'm just going to put the same sort of gap in each time and then we're going to hold shift and alt again I'm going to select all of those and hold alt and just duplicate these over to that side so that gives me my my blocks that I can aim at so now we can come out of this orthographic view let's just see what it looks like yeah pretty nice I'm happy with that so let's go back to perspective and at this stage, we'll realize that we can't see anything. That's because there's no lights in this because we started from scratch. So there's a couple of things we can do to remedy that. I'm just going to change it to unlit. And that will at least allow me to see where everything is. And what I'll do as a more permanent solution is I'll just create a material that's emissive so that we won't need any lights for now. So as you can see, I've already created a materials folder. You should do the same. I would show you me creating it, but it won't let me delete the one I created earlier. Whatevs, I'm not upset about it, but make sure you've got materials folder. And then in there, we'll create a new material. So right click, and we'll go material. I'm gonna call it M underscore um, basic. It's just a basic material. So we'll double click on that bad boy to get it open. Hello there. And all we need is a vector parameter. And the way I'm going to get that is I'm going to press 3 on my keyboard and left click. And that will give me a vector constant, or a constant 3 vector rather. And then to make that a parameter, I'll just right click and convert to parameter. And I'm going to call the parameter color. And then I'm going to connect that to both the base color and the emissive color. And I'm going to make the parameter white. Like so. Whoosh beautiful okay that's done we can save it awesome and now that that's saved I can just close it and I'm going to go into my static meshes folder and I need to apply that material to each one of these meshes so we'll start with the ball and we'll add m underscore basic save and you can see now things are starting to happen so we'll do it to the blocks as well so let's assign the basic material there save lovely and the game bounds And save again, and finally, the paddle. Ooh, yes, save. Okay, so they're all done, let's just check. Yep, yeah, looking good. So we can just close all these static mesh editors so that I don't slow my computer down too much. And now what I want to do is put a camera in the level so we can get an idea of the layout. So we'll go over into our modes panel here, and I'm just gonna search for camera. 
and I just want the basic camera. So I'm just gonna throw that in anywhere, doesn't matter where I put it, because I'm gonna set it to zero, zero, zero. Like so, so that just puts it in the center of the world. And one of the cool things this does is it creates, uh, while you've got it selected, so there it is. While you've got it selected, it shows you what that camera can see. And what I want to do is pin that, so when I deselect it, it will stay there. So I'll always know what the camera can see, which is very useful. And then I'm gonna press F on my keyboard just to frame it up so I can see what I'm working with for now. And I can see that it's facing the wrong way. So I'm gonna press E to turn on my rotate tool and point it that way. And then I'm also just gonna lift it up a little bit and point it down. I don't know what angle I want yet. We'll see what we got. Uh, and before I can line this up really, what I'm gonna to need to do is get the preview right. So you can see that this camera's too wide. It doesn't match the sort of dimensions of a phone screen that we set it to. So we need to do that. And what we can do is here, this aspect ratio, we can put in the width of the camera and that will sort that out. So we went for 480. So I'll type that in space X and then 640 and press enter. And you can see that now looks a lot more like the phone screen that we're going for. So you can decide what kind of angle you want this to be at. So I'm gonna go, just turn my move tool back on, a little bit higher. And one thing I'm gonna do as well is change my field of view. Um, and because I'm redoing this, I did find that last time I preferred a field of view of 55. So I'll go with that again. And then what I want to do is just get this set up so that I'm happy with it. So let's just move it back a bit. And I'm just using this view here just to guide where I want it. So I'm gonna go a little bit higher, a little bit further back, and that's pretty good. So that gives me an idea of how my game's gonna look. What I'll also do to check this is just click on play, and I would like to get an idea of how it looks in here, but as you can see, that's just not right. Where did that window just go? Come back here, window. So you can see I can move around in here, but it's not, not what I'm looking for. So we need to make it so that when we start the game, it's using the camera that we just put in there. So we'll go to the camera again. I'm gonna scroll down and we're looking for auto activate for player. I'm just gonna set that to player zero. And then when the game starts, it, it knows that we wanna use that camera. So let's click on play again. And there we go. So I've possibly got a little bit too much black space at the bottom. So what I might do is just move that up a bit to about there and then let's have another look yeah that's much better so by the time we've got the, the cliffs going up here and we've got um, we'll put a castle in there it should look pretty good I might tweak the the camera angle and position as we go but that's just to get it set up for now okay so that does it for this step in the next step we're going to set about getting this actually playable start moving things around creating some actual kind of code do some scripting so I look forward to seeing your beautiful little faces in that one. Okay, here we go. So let's start turning this into an actual game. And the first thing we need to do is get the paddle working. So we need to get it moving left to right so it can hit the ball into the play field. And what we're gonna do is create a pawn for that, which is a, a type of blueprint, and that's gonna act as our player. That's the thing that the player will control. So we have a blueprints folder which is where the game mode is. So let's open that up. I'm gonna create a new blueprint in that folder. So I'll right click in there, I'm gonna open blueprint class. And the one that I want is a pawn for this particular part. So I'm going to call it player paddle, like so. And then we need to open this up. I'll just dock it alongside my level there. Now that that's open, what I also want to do is go into the game mode and make it so that the game mode realizes this is the player we want to use. So let's just go here and open the game mode quickly. I'll just make sure this is saved first. And then here I'm looking for the default pawn class and it's currently set to default pawn, but we want this to be our player paddle pawn instead. And that's all we need to change there just so that when we start the game, it knows what we want it to use. So we'll compile that, save it, and close it for now. So back to our player paddle, what we need to do now is get the paddle in here. So this little sphere here is just like a, a null actor. It's the It represents the default scene route, I believe. 
so it actually doesn't do anything and we won't see it in game so we can ignore it what we want to do though is put the paddle in so we're going to go up here to add component and we'll just give it a click and what we want is a static mesh there it is so i started searching for it static mesh popped up and what that will do is put our static mesh here so i'm just going to call it paddle for now and then we actually need to tell this static mesh component that we want it to be the paddle so over here in our details panel here's where it's asking us what static mesh we want to use so from our list of meshes we've imported so far we can choose paddle and that will just drop in there that's pretty good so far then there are a few things that we need to do to the static mesh to the paddle to make sure that it works so the ball bouncing around is going to be based on physics uh, the physics system in unreal engine so we need to make sure that this is set to simulate physics so in the details here if we go not too far down there's a physics section and I'm just going to tick the box yes I would like this to simulate physics so that when something hits it it's likely to bounce off what I also need to do which is very important is make sure that this doesn't respond to gravity because we want this to be kind of hovering in midair if we turn gravity on it'll just fall so we're going to disable this thing here for, for enable gravity we'll disable it so take the tick out of the box so far so good and the last thing I want to do is just increase what's called linear damping uh, and what that does is kind of acts against if when we start it moving that stops it moving too freely um, and that's something we'll need to get the paddle to stop again so I'm just going to set that to 20 for now that's a nice number and then there's one final thing that I want to do to make sure that we don't get on any unexpected movement out of the paddle and that's to lock some of the constraints so we only want it to move side to side which in this case is the x-axis we don't want it to rotate at all so we're going to lock everything that isn't just moving on the x-axis so here we've got a constraint section so we're going to lock position on the y and z axes and we're going to lock rotation on x y and z so that it won't do anything we don't want it to and that'll do it in here for now so i'm just going to compile this blueprint and save it now it's time to do some actual scripting so whenever you're doing some scripting on a blueprint in unreal engine um, each blueprint has got its own event graph which is where the scripting happens so we'll open that and you'll see there are three nodes there ready for you so we can have it do something as soon as the game begins um, or when it overlaps with something or every tick which is kind of every frame uh, every CPU cycle but that's actually not what we want in this case so I'm just going to delete all three of those so we can put in just what we want I don't want this to be any messier than it needs to be and we're referencing the um, horizontal movement which we created in the input section earlier so if we just start typing uh, input axis so then it brings up this axis event and there's the horizontal movement that we created earlier so that's what we're going to do and what will come out of this is an axis value which can be anywhere between minus one and one which is what again what we set in the inputs earlier so we need to be aware of that because we're going to have to do some multiplication with it i'm going to use that to add an impulse to the paddle so we need to add a, an impulse node so i'm going to right click again and i'm going to search for add impulse and you'll see that this comes up and it also puts in brackets paddle so i know what i'll actually be adding this impulse to so i'm just going to put these either side of my screen uh, i'm just going to move the paddle down i'm going to try and keep this as neat as possible because these can get like really it's like messing with spaghetti when it gets complicated which we don't want so we've got an impulse there and that's what's going to add to the paddle and what we need to do to get something to move in a direction it's known as a vector so out of here the axis value we need to make that become a vector so i'm just going to drag out of here and search for make vector if i can spell it there it is and that will return a value and that's currently just happening on x which is what we want it to be doing and then what that will do is it's going to put a value so let's say we press the right key that's going to make x a value of one because it's coming from the axis value and that's going to be something that will be returned here but that's not actually going to be strong enough uh, if it's just moving one it's hardly going to move this at all we're going to need much bigger numbers so for that reason we're going to need to multiply this value here by something else so that something else is going to be what's called a variable and that's something that we can set a number in and we can do different things with it have it change in the blueprint during game which is really good so we're going to use what's called a float variable which is just a number but it's a number that can have decimal places after it as opposed to an integer that can only be um one number so one two three not 1.487 whatever so i'm going to add a new variable just here 
I'm going to call it speed since that's what it's going to control and by default it's got this red icon here which means it's a boolean which means it can either be true or false which is no good so I'm just going to change it here to a float and what I want to be able to do is to set its value here in default value but at the moment there's no inputs there for me to do that and that's because we haven't yet compiled it so it, it doesn't exist yet until we compile so let's compile it and you can see now the speed appears and I'm just going to set this to a default value of 500 to get us going so that means that when I put this into my blueprint so we'll just drag this from here and we've got the option to get it or set it at the moment we're just getting the speed so let's get that and we need to multiply it by this so what I'm going to do is just drag out of here and I'm going to do float and the one I want is this one here which is float times float it's multiplication so let's put that there and we'll just get the result going into x there and we're going to multiply it so we're going to get one or minus one going into here and then we're going to multiply that by speed which will be 500 so what will come out of here will be either 500 or minus 500 since the only options we've got at the moment is that a key is pressed or not pressed um, so it can well it can be it can be 500, minus 500, or zero when the key isn't pressed. So we get that, and then the return value for this is going to go into the impulse here. Like that. So this is nearly done, but actually this add impulse here is never going to be triggered. Because it's got nothing coming into it here. It's not going to execute. Um, so what we need to do is connect that from here. So this is when we get something on that horizontal input. Um, so when that happens, do this. So it's going to go through there and it's going to execute that. So add an impulse to it. So it's adding an impulse to the paddle. There you can see there's the target and the impulse is coming from here. Get the axis value, multiply it by 500 and put that into the impulse. And that's everything that we need to do for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to comment this. So select it all, press C, and I'm going to call that um, paddle movement like so so that later I'll know what this is so at this stage it's time to compile this and we'll save it and now we need to know whether or not this is working and we'll only know that through testing so it's time to go back to our level and we can see that we currently have a paddle in place but all this is really is a oh, hello all this is really is a dummy paddle um, this won't do anything so what we can do is delete that for now and what you might be tempted to do is to import this blueprint like that. That actually won't work for what we're doing, for the method we're using. We've got to put in what's called a player start. And that is that tells the game when it runs to spawn your default actor at that place, which will be our paddle. So we're just going to get a player start. No, nope, that says play to start. Oh, shame. So player start, I'm just going to throw it in anywhere. And then I'm going to set it to 0, 0, 0, like so. So that should be in the right place. So what we need to do now is just click on play to test this and see whether or not it works. So I've clicked on play. The good news is that a paddle has appeared. So I'm going to click in my viewport window. And then I'm going to press the arrow keys, left and right. And we can see it is moving, but very slowly. This would not be a fun game to play. So we're going to have to go back into the blueprint and make some tweaks to get this to run properly. So, my advice to you is to get hold of your speed variable and make this number bigger until you're happy with it. So, I already know that I like a value of 25,000, but you might want it to go faster or slower than that, so make sure you put your own value into something that you feel happy with. So, I'll compile that, and then we'll test again and see how that feels. So, that's much snappier. It's also hitting the edge of the level so that I can't get out of that. So that's all working pretty nicely. So now we've got our input set up. It's also working on A and D when I press those. That's pretty good. So if you do want to make your own little changes to this, the three things that are worth changing are, let's go to the paddle. It's worth playing with the mass. It's a kind of the default mass at the moment, but you can make it lighter or heavier and see what effects you get. You can also change the linear damping, which is how much kind of external force act on that paddle to slow it down and stop it after you've stopped pressing your button. And it's also worth changing um, the speed as well. Just to, And any combination of those three things will give different results. You just get something you're happy with so that it feels kind of fun or at least not horrible to move that paddle side to side.
So that's pretty much it for this step. Well done for sticking with it. We're now getting into proper scripting and stuff. It's very exciting. Uh, in the next one, we'll be doing a bit more setting up and scripting. We'll create a blueprint for the ball and get some logic working on that. Now that we've got the paddle into our level and working, the next thing we need to look at is getting the ball in there and get that moving as well. So in this step, we're just going to get it launching into the level and get it bouncing off stuff for now. That'll be enough to get us going. So let's do it. So the first thing we're going to need to do is create a new blueprint. So I'm already in my blueprints folder. And in here, I'm going to right click and choose blueprint class. And this time I'm going to choose an actor. There we go. And I'm going to call this BP underscore ball. There we go. And that's because it's a blueprint. And what I should have done is named this one. So I'm going to rename this BP underscore player paddle. There we go. So now everything's named properly. So we're going to open the BP ball. There it is. And the first thing we need to do is add the static mesh that is the ball. So same as we did for the paddle, we're going to go to add component. We're going to find static mesh. And then it asks us what we want to call it. I'd very much like to call it ball because it is a ball. And then over here, I can choose which static mesh that's going to be. So from here, I'm going to search for my ball. There it is. So now we've got ball into the blueprint. And now we need to set the behavior of the ball. So here, we're just gonna make sure that we simulate physics so that it will collide with things and bounce off of things. I'm gonna set the linear damping to zero. I'm then going to disable gravity because we don't want this falling. And we need to lock some of these as well. So we don't actually want this to rotate, so I'm gonna lock all the rotation axes. And the position, so the depth, the up and down in Unreal Engine, is the z-axis. And we don't want it to move up and down. We just want it to move side to side, backwards and forwards. So we're going to lock the z-axis as well. Okay, so that does it for the actual mesh and getting it to behave as we want to. Next, we need to get into the event graph and set up the behavior, get the logic going. So we'll just compile and save this for now. And we'll jump over to our event graph for the ball. So... We've got some events ready for us if we want to use them. In this case, we don't want those two, but we are going to eventually use uh, begin play. But first of all, what this event well, what this event play is going to do is it's going to call a custom event. So we're going to tell it to launch the ball uh, at begin play. And then we're going to create this event down here, which is going to be to launch the ball. So we'll do that first of all. So I'm going to right click and just start typing custom event. There it is. And we're going to add our custom event. And I'm going to call this launch ball there we go that's a descriptive name right so as this we want this to happen on begin play i'm just going to get this going now so begin play i'm going to type launch launch ball there we go so as soon as play begins it will run this launch ball script that we're going to write here so the thing that we're going to add an impulse to to get the ball moving is the ball so we're going to get that from components here so let's drag that in i'm going to get it and we're going to add an impulse to this to get it moving. So whenever begin play happens, we're going to launch ball, which will add an impulse to the ball. So far, so good. And then what we'll do is tick this box here for velocity change. And what that means is that it won't take mass into account. It will just set the ball to whatever speed we tell it to go. It'll go from zero to full speed without taking anything else into account, which is what we want in this case. And we're going to add an impulse to it. So I think if we go, we'll just see if it moves first of all. So let's set it to a thousand on the X axis. And then we will compile and save that for now. I'm just going to drag this alongside my level. And then we're going to put this ball into the level and see if it works. So first of all, let's just, this is our dummy ball, which we no longer need. That's just there to kind of give us a, a sense of position. So I add it at zero minus 70 zero i'll remember that so let's delete it we'll bring in our blueprint and i want it at zero minus 70 and zero and that i'll put that in exactly the right place and now all that's left to do is test it and see if this ball moves and bounces off of stuff so let's play there we go so it does it launches when we start the game and it bounces so we are going to look at this bounce in the next step but all we need to do now is just get it working properly. But So it moves, we need to fling it off into the level. So we need to change the angle of the impulse. So we'll press escape just to cancel that for now. 
and we've got it running at a thousand on the X so what I want to do is fling it up and in this case I know that that's going to be minus 1000 if I just did a thousand it would fling it down so we're going to go that way and then I'll compile that and then we'll test again and then the ball goes which is pretty good so what that leaves us with is there is a bit of a problem so the ball is not bouncy enough the surfaces aren't bouncy enough and that's because it needs a physical material that's what we'll be covering in the next step so make sure you stick around for that but for now we've done what we set out to do in this step we've created our blueprint for the ball and we've got some behavior on it to get it into the level once we get it bounced around we'll actually be able to try out our game and see whether or not it works as we want it to so i'll see you in the next step where we'll sort out the physical material get it all bouncing around properly In the last step, what we did is got it so that when we played the game, it'll fling the ball, it's not bouncy enough. And that's something that we need to sort out in this step. So it doesn't matter whether or not I can move my pedal side to side, because that ball's never coming back down the play field. We need to sort that out with something called a physical material. So what I'll do is I'm just going to move into my content folder here, and I'm going to put my physical material in the, the materials folder so that I'm keeping everything together. So to create a new physical material, it's right click in here. And then we'll go to physics to create it and then you'll see physical material listed there. So we'll give that a click. And then you get this weird box with only one option. So we'll click that because it's our only choice. And then select. And then we need to give it a name. So I'm going to call it PM for physical material. Underscore no friction. Because there's going to be no friction on this material. It'll also be very bouncy as well. So we just need to press enter to name that. And then we need to open it up. Here it is. So it gives us some settings that we can mess around with. The first thing we want to get rid of is friction. We want there to be no friction on this whatsoever. So we'll take it from 0 0.7 to 0. And the other thing we need to change is this option here called restitution. Uh, and it gives you in the, the name here, you can look in the tooltip. It says restitution or bounces of this surface between 0, no bounce, and 1, where the outgoing velocity is the same as incoming. That's the one we want. We don't want it to lose any speed, any velocity. So we need to set that to 1. Boom, very nice. Okay, so that's actually all we need to change in this physics material. So I'm going to save that. And I can close it for now. But we need to assign it to everything. And I, I planned ahead for this. So what I did is made sure that at the moment, everything's got the same material applied. So we could actually, if we wanted to, go into the ball here. And there is an area here to add the physical material. So we can put it in there and there it is. But I'm not going to do it that way. What I'll do instead is open the actual material, so the, the basic ball colour that we created here. And if I click on the, the main material node here, at the top there's a physical material option there. And that will do it for everything that's got that material applied. So I'm going to choose my no friction material. And then I'm going to save. There we go. And now that's saved, I'm going to test it out again. So let's play. And now we can see that the ball's not losing speed and it's bouncing very nicely. And it gives me an opportunity to, for the first time, really test the game. So what I'll do now is I will let the game run for a little bit. And you will hopefully see uh, the problem that we need to correct in the next step by the time I'm done. Okay, so here's our problem. Basically, there'll be times when the angle of the ball would be too acute to make the game playable. This here is not fun, and it's very unlikely that I'm going to be able to... There you go. So the ball will just kind of stop sometimes, and that it can break the game. There are times as well, I've not managed to catch it on this one, but it will get caught on the side, and you'll never be able to get an angle back into the ball, which again is not fun. So going forward in the next step, what we'll need to do is take control of the angle of the ball and we're going to clamp it so that it can only go at four angles so it'll be going at 90 degree increments but at kind of at a 45 degree skew so that should mean that the ball the bounce of the ball the direction of the ball is always going to be predictable and we know it's not going to kill the flow of the game so that's something that we need to pay attention to going forward that's the end of this step though we've now got kind of what i would call a, a minimum viable product 
this is the absolute minimum of what the game is. It's a ball that we can hit backwards and forwards. There are no real mechanics yet, but this if it feels fun knocking a ball up and down the play field, then we know we've got something to build on. And that's what we'll do going forward. Right, here we go then. This step is going to be all about controlling the way this ball is going to move so that it behaves predictably and in a way that's going to be more fun. So we're going to keep it at 45 degree sort of increments of, no, at 90 degree increments that, that's going to run diagonal. So what we need to do is get into the blueprint for the ball and set this up. Here we go. So let's go into our blueprints folder. Here's my ball. And I'm going to hop straight into the event graph when it opens up. <laughs> Here it is. So this is my event graph. So what I'm going to do is create a new custom event and that's going to be the thing that will happen that's going to make the ball do what we want it to do. So I'll right click and I'm just going to start typing custom event. And then the first thing I'll need to do is give this a name. And I'm going to call this velocity since we're also going to use this to keep the, the speed the same. Uh, and angle is what I'm going to call it. There might be better names for it, but I know what this means, so that means it works for me. And we're going to call this every tick. So what I'm going to do, we've got something happening on event begin play. But up here, I'm just going to have event tick. So this will happen every CPU cycle. And it's going to run uh, velocity and angle. There we go. So that's set up. So now what we need to do is build this script. It's going to be slightly more complex than what we've done so far. The difficulty curve kind of goes like, like this, straight up. So stick with me and I'll try and explain what I'm doing as I'm doing it. So the first thing we need to do is get the velocity of the ball. So the ball will already be moving and we need to get that information before we can manipulate it. So I'm going to do get velocity and it's this one here. It will say target is actor, which is what we want because that's our ball. So we'll do that first of all. And then what we want to do is clamp that. So out of the return value, I'm going to type clamp vector size. And what this will allow us to do is to clamp that velocity, the actual speed, to a constant value. So you could clamp it between like a high and low value, but we want to keep it exactly the same speed. And we'll use this node to do that. So we'll need a new variable to represent the, the speed of the ball. So here I'm just going to click on plus and I'm going to call it ball speed. And we want this to be a float, so I'm just going to select this. I'm going to change it from Boolean to float, remembering that float is a number that can have decimal places. And then we'll compile that so that we can set the default value to, for this to 1000, like that. And that means that the ball will start out at that velocity, at that speed. So what we'll do now is we'll get this ball speed. We'll bring that in and get. And we're going to plug this into the min and the max values of the clamp vector size. So what that will do is it's going to take whatever its velocity is and make sure that it can only be 1000. And what it also means is that when we come back into this variable at any point, we, if we think the ball is running too fast, we can change it. If it's running too slow, we can change it. Or if we want to speed up this, like the speed of the ball throughout the game to make it more complicated, then we can control that here as well, which makes it nice and easy. So that will basically control the speed. What we now need to do is get the angle sorted out. And we're going to take this vector size. So we've got the speed so far, but we haven't really done the angle. So let's drag out a return value. And then we'll create something called a rotate vector. Here it is. And we can use this to take the vector, which is the direction the ball's moving it, and rotate it to be whichever direction we want it to be in. So to do that, we're going to drag out of here and get something called a make rotator this little chap here, and we're going to set the z-axis, which is the yaw, to 45. And it's this change here that's going to make sure that we're always operating in diagonals, which is what we want. So out of the return value of this, we're going to create a make rot from x. And then what we need to do, this return value has got x, y, and z properties, but we need to control those individually. And in order to do that, we can right click on it and we can split the struct pin, which then will give us return values for each of the three axes we can rotate on. So what we'll do now is get the return value from the Z axis and we need to divide that. So this will be returning a number, which will be a float. And we're going to divide that by 90 so we can use that 
to give us one of four angles. You'll see how it works in a minute. So you can get a divide by either putting in a forward slash or you can type divide. And I'm gonna do a float divided by float. And I want to divide this number by 90. And that will mean that whatever the angle is, it's going to, when we round this, it can only be one of four angles. So the problem with this at the moment though, is that we can't work with it yet until we round it up or down to the nearest integer. So we're going to drag out of here, take the result, and we're going to do a round. And that will round the number to the nearest integer, and you can see the colour coming out of here has changed now, because it will only return an integer, which is what we want. So if we take a number like, uh, let's say it's going at an angle of 160, and divide that by 90, round it, and then what we'll do next in a minute is multiply it by 90, that's actually going to round it back up to 180 degrees. So it only gives us the angles that we want. So we're going to take the return value then, and we're going to multiply. So again, you can either type multiply to get this, or you can just put in an asterisk and we're going to do an integer and we're going to times it by integer in this case and we're going to times this by 90 or multiply this by 90 there we go lovely stuff so far so what we've done then is taken what is in any number between sort of 0 to 360 or 0 to minus 360 done some cool maths with it and we've spat out an angle that can only be 0, 90, 180, 270, 360, or minus 90, 180, 270. And that's going to be what keeps control of this ball for us. So we'll get a make rotator. And then the result of this needs to be plugged back into Z. So in doing that, you'll see this little conversion node comes up. And it takes the integer and changes it back to a float. Now what I could have done is I could have done a, an integer times float here and then the output would have been a float but I wanted to show you what happens if you need to convert one type of number to another. Unreal Engine works that out for you which is a nice handy little trick. So with this value we're going to get the return value and we're going to connect it to a get rotation x vector and this is what we can use then to control the direction of the ball again and then we need to unrotate this so out of here we're going to go unrotate vector lovely and then we need to make sure that we're getting it at 45 degrees again so from here this one here the make rotator we could make a new one over here if we wanted to but what i'm going to do is just drag the result here into there because these are both doing the same thing so we're rotating it here and then we're unrotating it again here uh, by 45 degrees so we need to multiply this by a vector length now. So let's create a vector length. Length, there it is, vector length. And we can see that the result of this is a float. So out of here, we need to do a multiply. And we're going to do a vector multiplied by float. So let's plug that in there. And then we need to figure out what to do with the result. But before we can do that, we need to get something coming into the vector length, which is going to be the speed of the ball. So... Here's the ball speed. So the clamp vector here is what needs to come out of here. So we're going to bring this over here. And oh, I'm so lost right now. And then plug that in there. So that that's getting the speed that can be multiplied by the angle. And then we're going to use this output here. So we've got angle up here, speed here. And then we're going to put that back onto the ball. So we started way back at the beginning by getting what was happening with the ball. And now, we're, now we've done all this modification of it. We're going to put it back onto the ball. So out of here, we're going to create a set physics linear velocity of the ball. There we go. And what it does is it gets the ball for us. So the static mesh here, so that it knows that's the target. And the new velocity is the result of this maths that we've been doing. Okay, so now we need to trigger all this. And so to do that, we've got an execution pin all the way over here. And so I'm just going to bring this over. And this just needs to be connected in here. So every tick, what's going to happen is this is going to be triggered, which by the time we've gone through it all, we are getting the velocity, modifying it, changing the angle, putting it all back together, and that's our new velocity. So what we need to do now is compile and save this, and then we'll give it a test. 
and see whether or not it allows us to get any different angles. And what I'm going to do here is just a little trick. So as well as doing this, I'm just going to get it to print the, the angle of the ball so that I know what's happening. So what I'm going to do is, after it's done this, I'm going to do a print string. And this will print the angle for me as some text in the top left hand corner of the screen. So as I'm only really interested in the angle, I'm going to get out of here the make rotator. We'll plug that into the in string. Again, it will convert it because it's coming out as one type and we want it as a text string. So we can see that modification happening. So I'll compile that again, save, and then let's test. Ball's not launching. Okay then, so it's clear that the testing has highlighted a problem. Uh, and I know what it is, I've done something very silly. So, the way we've currently got it set up, we're actually using a set physics linear velocity here. And that's what I should have used in the first place, I should have got the physics linear velocity, but instead, I used this nonsense node here, the get velocity. So we need to swap that out. So instead of get velocity, we're gonna use get linear physics velocity for the ball. That's the one that we should have used. I apologize for showing you the wrong thing. Um, so we'll need to swap this out. So let's get rid of that and we will drop this bad boy in its place. And then what we need to do is this execution pin here needs to go back over here and the first thing we're going to do is get the, velo the velocity and then the return value is going to go into there and then we can take this pin here and plug it into there. Ah, or we could if I was a better aim. There we go. So what we do now, it'll make more sense, is we are running this custom event. Let's get the current velocity of the ball, the physics linear velocity, as we should have done in the first place. Do all the same things to it and then set it back onto the ball. And we'll do the print string again to see whether or not it's working this time. So let's compile and save. Cross your fingers. Hey, 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 there we go. And then you should be able to see that on Y, um, the the angle is changing. So there we've got minus 90. There's 90 as it comes back down. There's 180. And that's what that maths has done for us. It's making sure that the ball will only ever move at one of those four predetermined angles as we've set them. And that will ensure that the game remains predictable, that the ball's not gonna to spend too long at one end of the play field, and that's gonna keep the pace of the game up. You can obviously do your own little trickery with the maths to get uh, the ball moving in different directions if that's what you want, or to kind of correct it if it's moving at any unwanted angles. But as I'm doing this as a making your first game in Unreal Engine tutorial, I don't really want to make it any more complicated than that. Because as you can see, I've done this before and I still cocked it up. So there we go. What we'll do now then is we'll remove this print string because we've, it's served its purpose. So in the next step, what we'll be doing is just kind of tidying up the work that we've done in this step. So we're gonna use something called reroute notes to try and tidy up some of this spaghetti looking stuff here. And we're also gonna comment any of the bits that we haven't done so far. So these areas could do with commenting uh, just to keep on top of things. So it doesn't get too confusing. Plus it'll be a nice uh, easy step after this more complicated one. I think we're all ready for a little bit of a breather. That was hard work. So I will see you in the next step. Okay, so here we go. In this step, we're gonna set about making our blueprints look a little bit tidier. So from the previous step, we were left with this, which is a little bit messy and difficult to follow. You've got the wires going behind nodes and it's a little confusing to look at. So we're gonna try and rearrange this so that it's easier to look at. So the first thing I want to do is I'm gonna have the main execution pins and wires going all across the top. So what I'm gonna do is just sort of move this up so that I get a pretty straight line, which I believe is there. That's not straight at all, is it? No, that's not straight, let's move it down a touch. That's pretty straight. Okay, so now we can make some more changes from here. So I'm just gonna move this to here so I can see what's happening there. And what else is happening? I'm pretty happy with that. I can see where that's going. I'm just gonna tuck that in a little bit. That looks okay. 
And then let's have a look where some of these pins are going that are quite confusing to look at. So this vector length here, you can see this is quite confusing and difficult to follow. So I think what I'm going to do is bring it down and sort of change the, the route. So I think what I'll do is just here I'm going to double click on this wire and that will add a reroute node. So with that selected I can then drag it and use that to put it down here. And then I can move this down to get this straight. Again, you don't need to have straight lines. Um, it just helps with my OCD if things can be straight if possible. And then we've got the same sort of issue here with this one. That's going behind a few of these nodes. So let's zoom in here. I'm going to double click on this, get myself a new reroute node and bring that down. Uh, that suggests now that that one's not straight. Let's move that up a bit. That's pretty cool. So that's easier to look at so far. And then I think the rest of it, there are no overlapping wires. So that's a lot neater. Yeah. So there are still things that I could do with this just to try and keep things a little easier on the eye. So I'm just going to try and keep things in a line where I can. It's not ever so important. Uh, it's just something that helps me sleep at night. If I know that things are, aren't any less neat, then they don't have to be. <laughs> so... I think that looks pretty cool. I think for consistency, I'm going to move that down there because I've got the same on the other side. Okay, so that's pretty pretty neat now. Much easier to follow. Um, we've got a couple of wires that overlap, but none that are completely hidden. And now what I want to do is comment this. So I'm probably going to put some comments within comments for this so that I know which bits are doing what. And for that reason, I'll probably move things around a little bit more. So let's just move that along here. Oh, I didn't want to move that one. So let's select all of these and I'm just going to move them along a little bit over this way. It's very nice. Okay. And then we know that this area here, well, this one specifically, is clamping the ball speed. So I'm going to select these, these two nodes and then comment clamp ball speed. So I know exactly what that's responsible for. And then this section of maths here, I'm also going to comment. And this is going to set to 90 degree angles. So that I can remember what that bit's responsible for. And then the whole thing I'll put in a comment. And I'm going to call that um, speed and angle of ball and that will really neaten that up I know exactly what I'm looking at now plus when I want to neaten things up later I can click and drag the whole lot around which makes it a lot easier and then just so that I know what I'm looking at here um, I'm going to comment this one speed oh that's how you spell speed speed and angle and I'll know that they go together this one's going to be launch ball and this one here is also to do with launch ball and I'm probably going to call this one event so that I don't get them confused and then I can just line those up so that they look nice and neat together beautiful okay so that's looking pretty neat I don't need to do any neatening up of this one because that's pretty pretty clean but the ball now looks much better easy to follow so I'm going to compile that and save it and now we're ready to move on to the next step now it's time to get the block into the level and behaving properly so we need to create the blueprint for that and set up the behavior to make sure that it disappears when it gets hit by the ball so step one, as you should be able to work out by now, is to create a blueprint for this. So I'm in my blueprints folder already. I'll right click and blueprint class this is going to be an actor the same as the ball is. There we go. And I'm going to call it BP underscore block. And then we'll open that up. Hooray. Okay, so the first thing we need to get in here is an actual static mesh. So let's do that. Add component. Static mesh, and I'm going to call it block 
because it's for the block. And then for the static mesh, I'm going to choose the block from my list. There we go. So far, so good. We'll just compile that so it's in place. Now, this next step is incredibly important, and it'll all break if you don't do this. What I want to do is have this disappear when the ball hits it. And unless we do this next step, this just will not work because it will never register a hit event. And I've banged my head against walls for far too long by forgetting to do this. So let's just do it now while we're thinking about it. So with the mesh selector, we're just going to scroll down a little bit. And it's this collision area here that we're looking for. And it's this simulation generates, let's just move that, generates hit events. And by default, that's turned off. So we need to tick that box so that when there is a hit event, it's registered and we can do stuff with it. Okay, so we've done that. Let's compile it. Beautiful. Next job then is to go into our event graph and we'll delete these. We don't need these right now. We're going to use um, something that comes off of this, the event. So we'll right click on the block and there you can see we get a list of events that are available to us. And what I want is add on component hit. So when something hits the component, which is the mesh, then it will do what we want it to do. So there is our event. And what I want to do is restrict this. At the moment, it could be that if anything hits it, it will fire off this hit event. And we want it to be only the ball that will do it. Because later when we start making this look pretty and adding things to it, there might be debris flying around, there might be overlapping meshes, and we don't want those to sort of automatically delete themselves. So from other actor, we're gonna drag out of here and we're gonna cast to the ball. Cast to BP underscore ball. There we go. And so now when it registers a hit event from something, it will ask, is it the ball? If it is the ball, it'll do the next bit, which will be destroy actor. And that'll remove it from the game. If, however, it's not the ball, it will do nothing. It will still register the hit event, but it knows not to do anything. That's what we want. So when it hits, check, is it the ball? So it's casting to the ball. It's having to cast to another blueprint for this. So what it's doing is talking to the ball blueprint. And so it says, are you the, the mesh that's interacting? If the answer is yes, okay, we can destroy the block. And that's how it should work. So we'll compile and save that. And now what we need to do is get all these dummy blocks out of the level, put in the new ones and test. So let's go into top view for that, make it a bit easier. I'm gonna hold Control and Alt to allow me to do a marquee selection. Nope, Shift and Alt. Shift and Alt to do a marquee selection. Delete all those, and now I can bring in my blueprint block. There it is. So I think X and Z should both be zero. And then I can line these up. So I'm gonna have a bit of a gap behind, I think I'll put it about, let's put it there in line with that. Or as in line with it as I can get it. That's really not in line, is it? Whatever. So I'll place it there. And then let's put a little gap between them. Like that. And then we'll select those three. Move them over to the side. Hopefully keep the the gap consistent, it looks like it's consistent. And then we'll have a few rows of these. Like that, is that gap consistent? I think it looks like it. Let's go for five rows. I don't know how many there is an actual breakout. Something like that. Let's go back to our perspective view. And now we need to see whether or not these will disappear when the ball hits them. So let's hit play. Up goes the ball. Come on, baby, you can do it. Hey, it destroyed it. Boom. And that's it. We've now got a lot closer to this function as a game. So as the ball goes up there now, it will remove these blocks until either the blocks are all gone or we lose control of the ball. So that's pretty good, isn't it? Well done, us. We are so good at this. Right, so that will do it for this step. I'll see you in the next one. Enjoy destroying your blocks. So what we want to do now is to get the ball to spawn when we spawn a new ball at the paddle, wherever the paddle is. So we need to first set that up in the paddle blueprint. 
so we'll open that up, the player panel. Here she is. And what I want to do is go into the viewport section of this and I want to add an arrow component. So here under add component, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll see that it's listed under utilities or you can just search for arrow. And you won't, won't really be able to see it, but if I just move this out of here, this is what the arrow looks like. Funnily enough, it looks a lot like an arrow. So I'm just going to move it about 90. Um, and I've moved it minus 90. You can see on Y I've moved it minus 90. And that's because I already know um, which way mine's facing because I did test this before I did the video. Um, and then what I also want to do is rotate this. So I'm going to start rotating it this way. And I want it to be at an angle. So just using this, I can't get 45 degrees. So I'm at minus 40. So I'm going to make that minus 45. And what that does is puts this arrow component so that it's above my paddle or it will appear above the paddle in the game. And it also means that when it launches the ball, I can make it launch at a 45 degree angle because we can follow the direction of that arrow. What we need to do now though is check that that's worked. So what I'm gonna do is check in rendering, visible, yes, but currently it's gonna be hidden in game. And when the game's finished, we want it to be hidden, but for now we need to be able to see it. So I'm just going to deselect that. I'm gonna compile my blueprint and then we'll go to play and test it out. And you can see that that has appeared exactly where we want it to. The problem though, is that it's not yet following the paddle. And we need that arrow to go with the paddle so that let's say we lose a ball and we want to spawn a new ball, ball over here, then the arrow needs to be there so we can spawn from there. So we're not there yet. The way that we need to do this is we'll go back into this player paddle. You can see here we've got the default scene route paddle arrow. And what we can do is make the arrow, if we just drag that onto there, we can attach the arrow to the paddle. So we'll do that and you'll see you get a little sort of dependency thing going on here. And then we'll compile that again and we'll test. And now when I move side to side, you can see that the arrow is following the paddle, which is gonna be very, very useful for us when we want to spawn balls. The next thing we want to get set up is give the, the player paddle the ability to spawn a ball. And we're gonna go back into our blueprint for that. And we need to be in the event graph. Here we are. So I'm gonna create a new custom event as I am fond of doing. So right click custom event and I'm going to call this event new ball. That seems like quite a descriptive name for this. So when this is called, I want to do a spawn actor from class. There it is. And so anytime this event runs, it's going to spawn an actor, which makes sense because we want it to spawn the ball. So from this class here, what we're going to do is tell it that we want the ball. So there's BP underscore ball, which is what I called my ball. So that's now going to be the one that gets spawned whenever we call this. And then what we need to do is you see we've got a spawn transform. And that the information we can give that is where we want this ball to spawn, which is going to be at the arrow. So we need to set that up as well. So what we're going to do is get a reference to the arrow. So I'm going to drag this in and we're going to get it. And then we need to get the position of that. So we're going to drag out of the arrow and we're going to do a get world transform. And then the return value is going to go into spawn transform. So let's review what we've got going on here. So whenever new ball is called, it's going to spawn a ball. There you go. And it's going to spawn it at the position of the arrow, which is exactly what we want. So I'm just going to neaten this up a little bit. Let's just put all these things here. Get, oh, not, not like that. Get these two, and I'm just going to bring those up a little bit. I'm going to put this all in the comment, which I'm going to call spawn ball. Good name. And then we need to be able to test this out. So I'm just going to create a new event, which is begin play. So whenever the game starts, and we're going to do spawn ball. No, we didn't call it that, we called it new ball, didn't we? New ball. So, at the beginning of the game, it's gonna spawn a ball, and we're gonna be able to test this in a minute, but it won't work yet because there's already a ball in there, and the ball's launching as well. All we wanna do is get it to spawn at this stage, so we need to disconnect a few things as well. So we'll go into the, um, let's just compile this. We'll go into the level. We'll delete the ball that's already there, so we don't get confused. 
lovely and then we're going to go into the ball blueprint for a second and somewhere yeah so on event begin play the ball is being launched we don't want that just yet so i'm just going to disconnect that by holding alt on my keyboard and clicking on the wire that connects them that's disconnected now and i'll compile that so now let's test this and see if it's working it is so we've got a ball that's being spawned at the beginning of the game at the location of the arrow at the base of the arrow the next problem we've got is that before we launch it we want the ball to follow the paddle we want it to go with it so that's the next thing we're going to set up in this step so let's just um, stop testing right the next thing i want to do then is i'm going to go back into my player paddle here it is and what we can do is we're making this blueprint the paddle spawn the ball um, but they're different blueprints so what we can do is if we want to do anything with the ball from within the paddle it helps to have that as a variable that we can talk to so at the moment we know that this is the ball so the return value is basically the ball so what I'm going to do is just drag out of here and then from the options I've got one of the top ones here is promote to variable so then we get this so it's going to say once you've got the ball make it a variable and there you go you can see it's called new variable underscore zero we're going to change that to ball and then going forward within this blueprint we can do things with the ball which will be very helpful right so now what we'll do is we'll go into the ball blueprint and we're going to make it so that the ball once it's spawned will follow the paddle while ever the ball's not in play so what we're going to do is create a new custom event custom event and we're going to call that update position there we go and so we're going to use this event to be the thing that updates the ball we only want this to happen though when the ball's not in play so when it's not active so to control that we're going to create a boolean variable booleans can either be true or false so it's going to be is the ball active true yes it's active false no it's not so whatever it's false we can update the position so we're going to create a new variable click here and i'm going to call it active like that and by default let's just compile this by default you can see that that's set to false it's not active which is what we want for now and then we can control whether or not it's active by setting this variable to true or false once we launch the ball or when the ball is dead so we'll set that up later okay so what we're going to do now is get this set up so we'll get active and we're going to get it and what we want is that whenever this is not true so we're going to drag out of here and make a not boolean so if that's not active we're going to create a branch now a branch is basically just an if statement if it's true do this if it's false do this so we're going to in fact if you even type if you'll see that branch here branch comes up um, but i'm going to search for branch because that's what they're called in blueprints so we'll create a branch like so and so the first thing that this update position is going to do is check whether or not the ball is active. In order to move forward, it's not active, which will be true. And then we're going to get a set actor location. There we go. So this is going to set the actor location of the ball. And we're going to relate that to the arrow. But at the moment, we don't have access to the arrow because that lives within the player paddle blueprint, this one here not within the ball so we're going to do something called casting to another blueprint and we'll do this at the beginning of the game we'll ask this blueprint to talk to the player paddle blueprint and say um, i want access to something in your blueprint which is going to be the arrow so we'll set that up now so just up at the top here we've got this event begin play that's currently launching ball i'm just going to put some more stuff over here that's going to talk to the the player paddle blueprint this is still disconnected for now so just here I'm going to right click and do get player controller just here and then out of the return value we're going to do get controlled pawn which is our paddle and then out of here we're going to do cast to player paddle there it is so this is all tickety boo and that's going to happen at begin play so i'll just connect that up so as soon as this happens we're getting all this information from the player paddle and then as blueprint player paddle we're just going to promote this to a variable 
and we're going to call that variable player paddle. So I know what it is. Oh, let's get rid of that capital L. Don't need that. So player paddle, and that now, at the beginning of the game, we're going to have access to player paddle. So that's one of the first things that the game's going to do when it starts up. It's going to say to the player paddle, can I have access to your blueprint? And then we've got access to that within this blueprint going forward. So that means we can now go back here and do stuff with that information. So what we need is a player paddle reference. So I'm going to drag that out here and we'll get that. And what we want to do, the thing that we're really interested in is the arrow. So I'm going to drag it out of here and type arrow and you can see I can get the arrow. So now I'm getting the position of the arrow, which is good. And from that we need to get the world location. Get world location. Because we need to know the position of the arrow. That's why we're interested in it. And then the return value of this, this get world location information that we've got, we're going to put into the new location. So where we want the ball to be put. So the target is self. Do it to the ball because we're working in the ball blueprint. And then if the ball is not in play, get the world location of the arrow and put the ball there. So that should make it follow it. But we need to then have something to trigger this update position to make it work. So somewhere in here, I think we already have event tick. We do. So you can see every tick is currently updating the velocity and angle of the ball. What I want it to do as well, in fact, let's just, um, so that's just doing speed and angle. So we're going to have to do a little bit of reorganizing here. And we also want it to do every tick, update position. There she is. And I'll put that in a comment just so I can see what I'm doing. Update position of ball. Just so I know what's happening there. Okay, so every tick, that's going to happen. And then what I would like to do is just neaten all this nonsense up a little bit. And then we'll put that in a comment as well. Update. Ah, update. I can't spell. Ah! Update ball position. Went a little bit French there. Okay, so that should work. So at this stage, we're going to compile and test. Now, I know this isn't going to work, so I'm making myself look stupid on purpose here um, because there's one other thing we need to update, but I want to show you the problem before we fix it. So we're just going to compile that and then we'll test. And the idea now is that the ball should follow the paddle, but it isn't doing. And that's because we need to make one change. So if we go into that BP ball, it's because the ball isn't the root. So it's happening to self, which is the whole blueprint. But the ball is kind of contained within the blueprint. It isn't like the focus of the blueprint. To fix that, we're going to drag the ball here on top of the default scene root. And then the ball becomes the default scene root. So we'll compile and save that again. And then play it. And <laughs> we're getting somewhere now. So what that means is that when a new ball spawns, it will spawn where we want it to, which is going to be just above the paddle. And we can take aim before we launch it, so we can move left and right. And so if let's say we're just aiming for that last tricky block, we can put the, the paddle over here, and then we can fire. Obviously, we've not implemented a launch ball yet, so we can't do anything with it, but we're getting there. In the next step, what we will be doing is getting it set up to launch the ball, so that we've actually got a game that we can play. So I hope to see your beautiful ass in that next step. Now that we've got the ball following the paddle at the beginning of the game, what we need to do now is get, get it so that the player can shoot the ball into the game themselves. So previously we had it that the ball would just fly off into the level at the beginning of the game. We don't want that. We want to give that ability to the player. So let's get that set up, shall we? So the first place I want to go is into the ball blueprint. So let's get that bad boy open. Here it is. And I want to update this launch ball event. So if you remember, we set um, an active property, an active variable on the ball, and we need to know at times whether or not this is active or not. When the ball is launched into the level, that means the ball is active, and that's going to stop us being able to spawn a new ball. So just into this launch ball event, what I need to do, I'll just move this along here, is out of launch ball, we're going to set set active, and we're going to set that to true. And then 
will know that the ball is in play. So we'll compile that. And while I'm in this blueprint, I also want to, we set this up here, which is to get the player controller. So I'm just going to comment this as well. Get player controller. Or just get player will be fine, actually. That's so just so I know that I'm casting to it there. If I ever forget, which is likely. And we no longer need the launch ball here. So I'm going to get rid of that as well. And that, because we're going to handle that elsewhere. So we'll just now move these over here just to keep things lined up a little bit. Okay, so I'm done in this blueprint. Let's compile that. I'll save it as well. And then what I want to do now is go into the player paddle blueprint. And this is where we're going to set up the, the ball launching. So we need this action to be triggered by an event, which is going to be when the player presses the fire key. So if we go to the project settings, hopefully you'll remember that we set up an input right at the beginning for fire, that's what it's called, and W, up, or spacebar will cause the ball to be fired. So we can now go into our player paddle, right click, and if we just type fire, because that's what we called it, we get an event for that. Beautiful. So this is gonna happen when we press that key, or one of those three keys. So what we need to do first of all is get some information about the ball. And we've got a ball variable here, which if you remember, when we spawn the actor, the ball, we set that into a variable. So every new ball that comes in that's spawned, what we can do is then mess about with it. So we're gonna get the ball, and we need to know a few bits about it. First of all, we need to know, is it valid? So we're gonna do is valid, and we're gonna use the one with the F next to it, there we go. And what that tells us is whether or not the ball exists. So if the ball doesn't exist, if it's not spawned for some reason, then we can't launch it. So that's one thing that we need to know. Did the ball spawn properly, is it actually there? We also need to know, is it active? So we're going to get active. Because if it's been launched into the game and it is active, we don't want this to work. So only if it's not active. So moving forward from here then, this actually needs to have a not coming out of it. A not boolean. Because we're only going to work with this if active is not true. So there's the not there. And we need both of these. So not active and is it valid? If both of those are true, we can move on. So we're gonna add an and boolean to get those two to work together. So we'll plug those in. So there you go. If the ball is valid and if it's not active, we can move on. What we've set up here is a condition. So we're going to just come out of here and we're gonna do a branch. There we go. So when we press fire, the first thing we're going to do is ask these questions. This, this is the condition before we can move any further. So is it valid and is it not active? And if that is true, we can move forward. And so what I'm going to do, I could just use this ball reference here, but that's going to get a bit messy. So I'm going to get a new reference just to bring it a bit closer, get ball. And then out of here, I'm going to go launch. And that relates to the custom event launch ball that we have in here. This one there, it's going to add the impulse to it and set the ball to active and that's gonna happen on true. So what we're saying is, we press fire, ask these questions, if it comes back true, perform launch ball on the ball. So we can now compile that. And now would be a good time to test whether or not this is working. So let's go here, we'll press play. I'll click here to make it active. So I can still move left and right, which is a good sign. The ball at this stage is still following the paddle, and if I press, I'm going to press up on my keyboard, and it fires. So, we've managed to get that functionality working perfectly. So, now what's going to happen is, I'm going to let the ball go, and this creates a problem, because there's nothing killing that ball when it falls out of the play area, so we can't use anything to trigger the spawning of a new ball to keep the game rolling. So, moving forward, in the next step, what we need to do is get that functionality in place. So what we're gonna do first of all is put a kill zone in something to kill the ball when it goes out of the, the play space. But just to tidy things up before we move on, let's comment this. So put it all in there, press C, and I'm gonna call this launch fireball, I think. Fireball. There we go, that's lovely. And we'll line that up. Okay, so that's that step finished. I will see you in the next step where we will be able to kill some balls. Now that we're able to fire the ball into the level ourselves, 
we need to be able to start building on this functionality. So we need to be able to have the ball, when, when it gets past the paddle, so the player, the, they'll lose the ball, the player's gonna lose the ball, and they need to be able to spawn a new one. But first of all, we need something to trigger the fact that that ball's gone. I'm gonna do that by creating a kill zone. So the way I'm gonna handle this is I'm gonna create a new blueprint. So a blueprint class, and it's gonna be an actor, and I'm gonna call it kill zone. Is that like a superhero name or something, like an X-Man? If, if it is in the comments, tell me, because it sounds like it should be. If not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copyright that. Killzone the X-Man is, is mutant power is killing stuff, <laughs> obviously. Right, so we've got our kill zone. Let's open that. Here it is. And all we need to put in this is a box collision, so that when something overlaps with it, we can do something. So let's add a component. And I'm just going to type box, so that I don't have to search for it. There's box collision. And there it is. And what I want to do with this, I'm just going to leave it called box, is I'm going to drag this onto the default scene root so that this is the only thing in this blueprint. And that will just stop any problems with errors later. So that's done. What we then need to do is go into event graph. We're going to get rid of all of these um, events. We don't need any of them. And instead, we're going to go to the box, right click on it, add event, and we're going to do it on, on component begin overlap. As soon as something begins to overlap with this box, something will happen. What do we want to happen? We want it to destroy the ball actor. So other actor, we're gonna drag out of there and we're just gonna type destroy. That's not how you spell destroy. <laughs> I'm not even close. Destroy. Why can't I spell? Destroy. <laughs> I did it, destroy actor. That was hard work. Right, destroy actor. Now, why am I not telling it to destroy the ball actor? because the only thing that could possibly overlap with it is the ball. Nothing else will be able to get near it. So there's, I don't need to complicate this by casting to the ball and making sure it's the ball. So we're just gonna leave it really simple. If anything overlaps with it, kill it. So let's compile that. And let's drag this over here for now in case I need it. And we'll go into our level. So this is not gonna work until we put one in our level. Now the first thing I want to do, so let's just get a kill zone. Uh, let's just save them all first, just in case. Okay, so I'm gonna put one in there, and then I'm gonna set the location of it to just be zero, 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 and that's so that I know that it's on the right level. And then I'm gonna move it up into the level. Now this is not where I want the kill zone to be, but if I move it below here, which is gonna be off camera, if it destroys the ball, I won't see it, which will make it difficult. So I'm gonna test it up here first. So I'm gonna make it a bit bigger, and I'm just gonna stretch it to fill the play area. And you can see I'm overlapping it with the um, the outer bounds area or the, the game bounds. And why won't it delete that because it's overlapping? It's because in the game it will only be any new overlaps when the game starts. This is already overlapping so that's safe but when the ball overlaps it, it will destroy it. So we'll leave that there and we'll just click on play to test it. So there we go, left and right, press up and as soon as it hits that, it disappears. So we're now able to destroy the ball. Now obviously we haven't set the functionality up to create a new one yet, but we don't need it yet. That's the next step. So what I'm gonna do is bring this down here. And what I want to do is make sure that I can see this in game. Um, in fact, let's just test this first. I'll put it back up there. I'm gonna go into my kill zone, uh, select the box collision, and you can see that it's currently visible, but it's hidden in game. So just for now, I'm gonna remove that because I want to be able to see where I'm putting it. Um, to make sure that it's where I want it to be. So let's just compile that and let's just play, make sure we can see it. We can, so I'll know exactly where I'm putting it. So I just don't want it to be in the way. So now what I can do is bring this back towards the player and we can see where the player starts. So I just need it to be below that. So we'll try there. Yeah, we'll go a little bit lower actually. And then we'll go wider. Let's try that. Yeah, so you can see it's just, just, uh, just below the paddle. So the paddle's not going to accidentally collide with it. And then we'll send the ball into the game and test it. And make sure that it behaves as we expect it to. Yep, we saw the ball disappear. So if we wanted it to fall off screen before it disappears, then we can just move it off, off screen a little bit. But I'm happy with that for now. So let's just press escape there. I'm gonna go back into my kill zone, make it hidden in game because I don't need to see it anymore. Compile. And then I'm just gonna do one more thing in my level before this step's complete. And it's to create more of these. 
So what I'm going to do is just got my move tool on. There we go. Hold out. I'm going to put one up here. And then I'm going to get another one here. And I'm just going to change the shape of it. Make it thinner and taller. And these are going outside of the game. Why are they doing that? Because just in case the ball manages to get out of the, the game bounce somehow... What I want to happen is it'll at least spawn a new ball. If it gets out there and just keeps flying off forever, um, the, the game will be broken. The player won't be able to keep playing and they'll have to crash the app, which we don't want. So we're giving it a fail safe. It's still going to be a bug and it won't look right because the player will lose a life, but at least the game won't be completely broken. So it just gives us a nice little fail safe. So I'll put these out here like so. And then what I'll do, I probably shouldn't have turned these off, but I'm just going to, there you go, make it so that it's not hidden in game again. And let's play it. And the main reason I'm doing this is just a test. Because I've left them overlapping, I want to make sure that they're not killing each other, which they're not. So there you go. You can now see that outside of the game bounds, if the ball manages to squirm out somehow, we're fine. It won't completely crash the game. Beautiful. Okay, and that will wrap this step up. Now that we have the ability to destroy the balls, in the next video, we need to be able to spawn a new one as soon as the game detects that one has gone. So that's what we'll be doing next. Now that we have the ball being destroyed when it leaves the play field, we need to make it so that we can spawn a new one. And that's actually really, really easy to do. So this step's going to be a short one. It won't take as long to do it, um, but we need to do it. It's short, but important. Much like my P, never mind. Um, right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is sort out the name of kill zone, um, because for some reason, I just completely ditched my naming convention. So we'll fix that first. I'm just going to go rename and I'm going to call it BP underscore kill zone. Bonus points if you were shouting, no, you're naming it wrong when I did that. Um, and there we go, that's done. Right, what we need to do now is go into BP ball. Let's open that up. And the thing that's going to trigger the spawning of a new ball is when the last ball gets destroyed. And there's actually an event for that. So if I just right click and type destroyed you'll see the event destroyed pops up. There it is, lovely. So basically what we're saying to Unreal Engine is, as soon as this particular blueprint, this ball gets destroyed, we can spawn another one of them. So what we're gonna do is go to, we need to get the player paddle, I will show you why. So let's just open the player paddle up. And the reason that we're going into the player paddle is because it's the player paddle that has the spawn ball blueprint. So we need to get the player paddle, and then from here, I'm going to type spawn um, ball. No, what did I call it? New ball is what I called it. Let's just double check. Yeah, the custom event's called new ball. That makes sense. Right, so what we're saying is that whenever this gets destroyed, run the new ball script in the player paddle blueprint. And guess what that will do? It'll give us a new ball. So let's just comment that up. Um, so, new ball when one is destroyed. Yeah. So we need to test it. Let's do that. So compile, save, and into here. So let's play. So what I need to do first is launch the ball. That's all still working. Jobs are good in. And then we'll let it flap around the level a little bit. I need to move my paddle out of the way and... Hey, it works. So, now we could just play this forever until we destroy all the blocks. And then, well, we could still keep playing it. Uh, and that's, that's all good. So, yeah, a successful step. Well done, everyone. What we're going to be doing in the next step is starting to get it so that we can set these blocks up with different colours and have different scores so that then we can get the on-screen score displayed and start turning this into more of a game. In this step, what we're going to be doing is setting up our block blueprints so that we can have different colored blocks and have the blocks with different scores all coming from the same blueprint actor. So that's what we'll set up now. But first of all, I just want to do a bit of tidying up in the ball, uh, a couple of jobs that we need to do. So the first thing I'm going to do is find my uh, begin play section here, which is where I'm getting my player. 
and I want to get the game mode as well because we're going to need to make it so that um, we're getting scores from the blocks when they're de destroyed and we're going to need to store the scores in the game mode uh, and then get that printed to screen so we need to make sure that we've got access to the game mode in here and so the way I'll do that is I'm just going to right click here and do get game mode oh <laughs> get game mode there we go and out of the return value of this I'm just going to cast to my game mode so there it is BO game mode for breakout and then what I want to do is just get that so that it follows from this begin play because as soon as we begin the game I want to make sure that we've got access to that so there we go let's just line that up a little bit lovely and what I want to do is make sure that I've got access to this as a variable within this blueprint so I'm going to as game mode drag out of here and then just promote to variable and that's going to set this as a new variable and we're going to call it game mode and then we've got access to our game mode which is good and of course it's always a good idea to comment so let's add a comment to that and it's just going to be get game mode so we know what that's doing the last bit that we need to do on this before we finished is just compile and save and then we're done in this blueprint for now where we need to be working now is in the block blueprint so we'll move back here to find it there's the BP underscore block so let's get that open and now we can add some features to the block so all we have really on this happening so far is that when the ball hits it then it's going to destroy which is fine but we need to get a few other bits of functionality in there as well and we're going to do that through the use of the construction script uh, the construction scripts basically these fire every time a block is spawned so we, we can have control of that at the actual spawn of a blueprint rather than at the beginning so in, a, in a, the regular blueprint in the event graph we can do things on begin play but we want this to happen whenever it spawns so into the construction script for that here's the little purple thing to get us started so what we're going to do to get the blocks with different colors is we're going to create a dynamic material instance and that will just allow us to when we drop a block in the level we can then change the color of it and it'll all be based on the same blueprint so that's really cool so what we'll do is just click on block up here there we go and then we're going to just from our construction script we'll drag out of here and we're going to do a dynamic material instance so there it is create dynamic material instance for the block so we will select that and what we need to do is set the source material for this so what we're going to be creating dynamic instances of it's going to be the m underscore basic for now which is just the the one material that we've created so that that makes sense now we need a new variable so i'm just going to click on the plus symbol here we're going to call this block color oh i get my capitals in the right place block color and what i'm going to do with this is i'm going to click on this little i here so you can see that it says the variable is not public and will not be editable on an instance of this blueprint that's telling us that it's not doing what we want it to do. Let's click that and it shall, it'll change the um, variable is public but missing tooltip. <laughs> I don't think that's supposed to happen. I think there's a little bug in Unreal Engine. Um, so what this means, I'll explain it for you, is that now we've clicked on the ad, this makes this, this variable public. And so when we're in the level, whenever we create an instance of this blueprint, we can change this variable which will be very useful to us uh, for creating our dynamic material instance for each of the different blocks. The type of variable is not right for this because at the moment it's a boolean and we want to change the variable type to linear color. So it's not in the kind of standard one so I'm just going to uh, start typing it linear color. There it is. And then we know that that will be a color which is what we want. Whilst we're not going to be doing anything with the points yet, we are going to take this opportunity to set it up. So we're going to add another variable as well. Uh, I'm going to call this one points. So this is what each one of the blocks is going to be worth. This needs to be public as well so that we can change that from within the level. And we're going to change the variable type to float. Integer probably works as well, but I'm going with float. So at this stage, I'm just going to compile and save just so I know where I am. And it gives me access to some of my variables here as well so you can see now I can change things here if I want to or if I can see what I'm doing we've got a color there as well but we're not quite done with this construction script yet so out of the return value here we need a set vector parameter 
and you can see that we're now going to be setting the color using this it tells you in the tooltip for this the target is the material instance dynamic we've got a dynamic material instance here i don't know why they've changed the ordering of the words but that's going to allow us to set that and what we need to do is just get the block color so let's get it and uh, we're going to connect it to the value so that's what's going to be setting the color of our dynamic material instance and just so that we get um the right starting color i'm going to set the default color of the block material to white and it will at least match up with what we've got already i also just want to give a name to this parameter uh, under parameter name i'm just going to call it color that should do nicely and that should do it for us for now so we're going to compile and save this and see whether or not it's having the desired functionality in our level so let's go back to level one you can see I've already got my uh, my rows of blocks set up so let's get a little bit close to these so I can see them lovely and I'm just going to select uh, I'll select them a row at a time so let's get this top row here and the color for these they're kind of furthest away so I'm probably just going to set these to red you can see now that I've got them selected these parameters that I've just added have become available so I can set the color of these blocks, hopefully. So let's set these ones to red. Hey, <laughs> it's working. Woo! So we set those to red. Bonza. And let's say that these are going to be worth 100 points. That is some big points right there. Okay, so keeping sort of in line with the original, I think the next row I'm going to have as being like an orange color. So... Let's just find something that looks kind of orange. Um, that's nice and orangey, I think. So we'll click OK on that. And the points for these, let's have, we're going to set these at 50. That is a good points number, I think. Then we're going to work our way down to the next row. I think you can see where I'm going with this. Now you can probably work out the rest for yourself. But I shall put it on video just to be helpful. Um, according to my little guide that I've got on screen as well for the, the breakout colours, I think this is going to be like a lighter orange. So let's just, or maybe going towards yellow, something, just a yellowy orange, let's, let's go with that. And the next set of points we're going to set to 25, we'll halve it again. And then we're going to go to the next to last row right here. We'll give these 10 points each. And the colour, we'll probably just keep working our way around this colour wheel, I think, is a good way to go. So yeah, we need to be hitting the green spectrum a little bit. And then we'll just go to this nearest row of the blocks. And five points. These are rubbish blocks. We don't want any more than five points for these. Because they're not that good. They're just the closest ones. And we'll have a nice greeny green colour. Hey, that looks beautiful. It's like a rainbow. Okay, let's have a little look. See how that's looking in game. Oh, that is looking pretty. There we go. So we now have different coloured blocks that we can add in level. And we can also assign different points to them, which we can add up. We're not actually counting the points up yet. We're not doing anything with them. Uh, but it does mean that we will be able to going forward. So before we can actually do anything with the score, we're going to need a bit of a UI to the game. So we're going to need to count how many lives or balls we've got left, and we're also going to need to put the score on screen. So the next step is going to be about setting up that UI and getting it to display. Moving forward, we're going to be adding some more game style mechanics to this. So we're going to make it so when the ball falls out of the level, we're going to lose a life. And as we hit the blocks, we're going to start collecting points. And we need a way to communicate that to the player. And we're going to do that through the use of a heads-up display or HUD, which we'll be creating and adding to the screen in this video. So let's get stuck in. I'm already in my blueprints folder, which is where I need to be. And I'm going to right-click in here. And at the bottom of this Create menu, you can see that there's a User Interface section. Oh, there it is. And at the bottom of that menu, you can see there's a Widget Blueprint. And that's what we're going to be creating. So we'll click on that. The first thing I'll ask us to do is give it a name. We will. We're going to call it de for heads up display. And then we need to get that open so we can work on it. So double click. And here it is. 
So at present, you can see this um, rectangle here represents the sort of shape of our heads-up display. And we know that we're currently building for a portrait style phone screen. So this, this is not going to work really. So in the top right of the screen, you can see it says screen size here. We're going to go down there. We have phones. Uh, and I'm just going to stick to the Samsung Galaxy S4 preset because it kind of fits in with the, the shape I want without being too high res. So that's what we're going to do. This still leaves it in landscape mode though, which is not what we're looking for. So this little chappy up here, switch between landscape and portrait, is what we're going to use to get this face in the right way. And then, just as we do in any blueprint, we can move this around. So I'm going to center it just by clicking with my right mouse button and dragging it into place. Now we can start bringing in the elements that we need from over here, which is called the palette. And the first thing I'm going to create is something called a horizontal box. So I'm just going to start typing this horizontal box there it is and I'm going to drag that in like so I'll zoom in on it a little bit and I'm just going to expand the size of it so that I've got room to do what I need and I'll get it to contract back down to the size I want in a minute so this box here doesn't do too much on its own we need to add some text to it to allow it to display what we want it to so I'm going to use this text here which is just a block of text so I'm going to put one in there and you can see it kind of snaps inside it knows where we want to put it and I'm going to put another one. So I've got two text blocks side by side. And I've kind of aligned them to the left as well. And then I'm going to select this first text block. And you can see the t details are over here. And here's the text. And it currently says text block. So I'm going to change this to points. Oh, not popins. Points. And then I'm going to add a colon and a space. So that, that it has that little bit um, of extra room before I actually put the score in. And then when I press enter, you can see that that updates. And then for the next text block, I'm going to just put in like a dummy score for now. So let's say that the highest sort of score might be 9,999,999. Maybe if they score more than that, they break the game. So there we go. That's kind of set up as we want it to be. And now what I want to do, we've got a lot of this original box here, this horizontal box that we don't want. So let's click on it. And there's a tick box over here that is size to content. So when I click on that, you'll see that that snapped it back to size and I'm now not using any more of a horizontal box than I need to. So what I want to do now is get this box positioned. So I want to kind of plop it up here in the top left. So you can see the position X and Y currently have values. I'm gonna set those both to zero and that'll stick it right in the top left of my screen. But I don't want it to be right up there because there's no sort of buffer. So I'm gonna bring it in by about 30 on position X and 30 on position Y. And that just brings it in a little bit. Now this is where my points are gonna be. I also want how many lines we've got left to be displayed top right. And I could go through the process I've just gone through again by creating the box, putting the text in, or I can duplicate what I've already got. So here's horizontal box here. Uh, and I might just call this, I'm gonna rename this so I know what, which one it is. So this is gonna be points. And then I'm going to right click and duplicate this. And you see it gives me another horizontal box. I'm going to rename this one to lives. And then with this selected, what I'm going to do is change the anchor position to the top right. And you see we get a little flowery icon. And that's telling us that everything we do with the size and position is in relation to that anchor point. So I'll show you what I mean by that. If I now make it zero and zero, it anchors it over here. Whereas this one, you see the anchor point for that one is in its original position and its position is in relation to that. So back onto this lives one, I do know that what I want on position Y, I believe it's Y, is 30. And that gets them at the same height. And I'm also just gonna do position minus 30 to give me some of this, just to bring it in a little bit. And then I'm gonna align this on X, I think if I make it one, that should line it up about consistently, which looks good. And we see we get points and a number again. We don't want those anymore. So from my hierarchy, this time I'm gonna change it to lives. Look at the it's. And then the number doesn't need to be as big at all. It's only gonna be um, one digit really. So what I'm gonna do is just put one in there for now. 
and you can see that's moved across as well everything's nice and aligned it didn't stay too far over so now we've got the points positioned in the top left and the lives positioned top right so at this stage we've pretty much created our heads up display but it's not going to appear in game yet we need to set it up so that it will appear in game so let's compile and save it and I'm just going to dock this up here and then I need to get into my game mode that's where we're going to load in the HUD so we'll open it, it looks like this we need to get into the full blueprint editor to get at all the properties so let's open this up and the HUD is something that we are going to want to create um, on begin play as soon as the game starts running so that's this is the event we're going to be using so from begin play let's um, create widget it's a widget that we created for our heads up display and then the class from here we can select the HUD that's what we called it so it's going to create that for us and later we're going to want to talk between the HUD and the game mode so that the HUD can get the information to display on screen how many lives have we got left what's the current score so what we're going to do is get the HUD out of the return value we're going to promote it to a variable and we're going to call it HUD and that will help us to get that working later to get the functionality into the heads up display so it's not actually just displaying static values it can change dynamically based on what's happening in the game and one other thing that we need to do with this heads up display is add it to viewport so we can create it but we've actually got to get it into the viewport for the game so we can see it otherwise it would be useless okay so what i'm going to do now is just comment this up um, and we're just going to call it add hud so we know what that's doing and then we'll compile save and now it's time to test so what i'm going to do is i'm going to test in two ways so you can see you don't get confused by it so i'll play first of all and you can see let me just release my mouse lives is up here and here which is not in the aspect ratio that we created originally and that's fine because it's taking up the whole window so if instead of doing that i use this drop down and we do new editor window you can see this is kind of the size and shape that we're we'll working with and it looks to me like our points and lives are pretty much where i want them to be so i'm happy to wrap up at this stage if you want to though you might want to go back into your hood maybe change the font colors positioning make it so that you're happy with it make it your own you know be creative with it uh, and then moving on in the next video we'll get the lives counter working so we're going to set how many lives we want the player to start with spoiler alert it's going to be three and then we're going to get this part of the hood to dynamically show that we're not going to start taking lives away just yet i don't think we'll see um, but we are going to get the hood to display that for us so that's what's coming up next last time we set up the heads up display which you can see i've still got open here but it doesn't do anything yet it's very static so this video is going to be about getting the live set up and we're also going to create a, a reset game action as well which is what's going to set our elements in the heads up display back to kind of defaults and that's actually where we'll start in this video we're going to create the reset event first of all we're going to do that in the game mode i've already got that open from last time and we still need to be in the event graph for it and the first thing i'll do is create a new custom event and I'm gonna call that reset. Good name. We also need some new variables to track things like how many lives we've got. So I'm gonna add a variable and I'm gonna call this one max lives. So this is the maximum number of lives that we can have, which is what will be the default when the game resets. And you can see by default, it's a, a Boolean, which is of no use to us. We're gonna set it to an integer, which can be whole numbers. And then to be able to use this, you can see at the moment, there's nothing displayed for this variable. We'll compile it. And then we've got an option to set what we want the max number of lives to be. I want it to be three. So you should then get four lives in total. You'll start with one, uh, one ball to fire, and then that will replenish three more times. We now need to create one more variable. And this is going to be lives. So this is how many lives the player has. So that's already come in as an integer, which is good. And we'll just compile that so that we can do things with it. So the first one we're going to want to do when we reset the game 
is set the current lives to whatever number. So we're going to get this in, drag it in, and we're going to set it. So when we reset the game, we're going to set the lives to get max lives. So the first thing we're going to do is set the lives to whatever the max lives variable is, which at the moment is set to three. Now what we're going to do is move back to the heads up display so we can work on the functionality. And in the last step, we just worked in this designer part of the heads up display screen. Uh, there's also a graph part where you can add some functionality and that's what we're going to explore now. So let's give it a little click there. And the one that we want is event construct. So when this is created. So we can delete uh, the tick event and we'll also delete pre-constructs. We don't need that right now, but it is this event construct that we're going to start with. One of the first things that we're going to need to do is get this heads up display talking to the game mode. The game mode's holding all the information about how many lives uh, and what the score is going to be. So the first thing we'll do is get casting to that and we'll, set, we'll promote it to a variable so that we can talk back and forth whenever we want. So out of event construct, we're going to cast to game mode. And it's um, BO game mode is the one that we created, the breakout game mode. And here, just to make sure we get the game mode, we're going to go get game mode. There it is. So the first thing we're doing upon creating this heads up display is making it so that it can talk to the game mode. And then as game mode, we're going to promote to variable. We're going to call it the variable game mode so we know what it is. And then I'll comment all this with just get game mode so I know what it's doing. So now that we can talk back and forth between, well, I just need to compile that. Uh, now that we can talk back and forth between the HUD and the game mode, we can start doing things with that. So back into designer for a sec. And remember we said that we're setting up lives at the moment. So we're going to get this lives text box and I'm leaving that at one deliberately for now. And I'm selecting the text box for the number of lives. So I've just got it from down here because it's a bit messy up here. So just click on that one there. And then we're going to create a binding to some functionality. So here we've got bind. So I'll give that a click and we're going to create a binding. And then this opens up a new little scripting window, a widget blueprint for us. And in here, we're going to need a variable called lives. So let's create a variable lives. Lovely. This variable needs to be an integer as well. So let's change that to an integer. And then so that we've got access to it, we need to compile and then we can actually use it in in our script. So what we're going to do now is drag this in and we're going to get lives. And then out of here, we're going to create a two text node and it's going to be an integer. And that's going to go into our return node. Like so. And then we're going to compile there and save as well. And then we need to go back into the game mode to get these talking to each other. So what we need to do now is to get the heads up display. And from here, we need to set lives. And that's the, the lives that we just created in the heads up display. So what we're going to do then is connect this up so that that's going to execute. So whenever the game resets, it will set the live to the max lives and also set that on the heads up display as well. So that's what's going to display. And that will be magnificent. So we're going to compile and save. And now is a good time to test, but we're not expecting it to work. And I will tell you why. So let's just click on play. You can see the lives is currently set to zero. It should be setting it to three. And the reason that this is not working is because we've not yet got anything making the game reset. And this only happens when the custom event reset happens. So just for now, we're going to call this event over here so that this actually works. And this is happening on begin play. So now we'll compile, save, and test again. And now that's working. It's showing that we have three lives. So in the game mode, it is setting that the player has three lives, and it's also displaying that the player has three lives. And that's everything that we needed to achieve in this step. If you're feeling confident, you could have a go at setting up the score yourself. It's gonna be a very similar process. But if you're not feeling so confident, don't worry, because that's what's coming up in the next step. So I will see you there for that.
Now that we've got the HUD working with the lives and that's all being tracked, we're now going to do the same for the score. So we've got to get the game mode set up to track the score and also feed that information through to the heads up display so that that's all working correctly. And we'll start by setting up the binding in the HUD just like we did for the lives. So let's make sure we've got the HUD open. We have. I'll just zoom in a touch. So we're going to be working on this box here, which is where our placeholder score is. And we're going to go into here and create a binding for that, which again opens our widget blueprint as in the previous step. In here we need to create a new variable for the HUD and we're going to call it points. So we've got lives already, so let's make a new one and we'll call it points. Of course we don't want it to be a boolean because that won't work, that can only be true or false. So we'll change it to an integer which will work for our purposes just nicely. And then so we can work with that we're just going to compile the blueprint and that means that we can now drag the points in. So we're just going to start by getting the points like so. And as in the previous step, we need to get a two text node so that we can return that into the return node up here. So we're getting whatever the point should be. Return value is going to be changed to text and then send that to the on screen display. We now need to go back into our game mode. So there it is, BO game mode. And I'm looking for my reset event because when we reset the game, what we've got happening so far is we're just resetting the lives, but we're also going to need to reset the score back to zero. So that's what we'll set up now. So what we're going to do is we've already got our HUD here. So we're just going to drag out of here and we're going to set the points. So there's points there. We can set that and we're going to be setting it to zero. That'll work nicely. So now when we reset the game, the two elements of the heads up display are going to be set the lives to whatever the max lives are and then set points back down to zero. Now would be a good time to compile that to make sure that that's all going to be working properly. Now what we're going to need to do is create a new custom event within the game mode and we're going to use that custom event to actually keep score, to update the score. So we'll right click, create a new custom event. I'm going to call this update score like so. We're also going to need a variable in this game mode to track the score. So we'll create a new variable and we're going to call that current points like that. That's already come in as an integer for me so I don't need to change it, that's good. And we're going to select this new custom event and under inputs here, we're going to add a new parameter. I'm going to call that parameter points. And we'll use that shortly. And that's going to be an integer as well. Okay, so what we can now do is we've got this current points. So we'll drag this in and we're going to set it. And we're going to drop this just at the end of our reset game script. So we're setting the score back to zero. And we're also setting the score on the HUD back to zero. So that's all working fine. So now we're going to do this update score script, which is going to have a check in it. So because we're going to take points off the player whenever they die, we need to add a check so that if the score ever goes below zero, we just set it to zero. We don't want to have minus scores. Um, so we'll set that up now and hopefully it'll all make sense. So the first thing I want to do is just get current points like that. And we're going to add so we're going to do int plus int, I believe, int plus integer plus integer, there we go. And we're going to get the points from here, which again we can set later, and the current points, we're going to add those together. And then we need to do the check coming out of the result of this, because if we're adding minus 500 to 200, that's going to give us minus 300, which we don't want. So we're going to add the check, and the check is, is it equal to or less than? like that and we're going to add a branch to this because this is the condition so I'll just drop that down there and then we can connect that up so what we're asking is when we update score is the score first of all going to be zero or less than zero if that's true we just want to set the current score to zero so set current points to zero. So that makes sense. If it's false, however, 
then we can actually add the score on because we're probably going up rather than down. So if it's false, we're going to set the current points again. But this time, instead of just setting it to zero like that, we're going to set it to the result of this addition here. I'll just pop a, we'll pop a reroute node in here just to make that a little bit easier to read. There we go. So that's going to add those and set the current points to that. But we also then need to, so at the moment we're tracking the points, but we're not sending it to the HUD. So we need to get that updating there as well. So what we're going to do is get the HUD. And then as the HUD, we're going to set points. So it's going to follow this whichever way it goes and the points target is going to be the current point so we'll get this and that's going to go in there like so. So I've got a feeling that I could do with neatening this up a little bit so let's attempt that. Just going to drop a reroute in here so I can follow that. Yeah, so that's looking pretty good. That makes sense. So I'm going to add a couple of comments while I'm here. So I'll add a comment up here for reset game. And we'll add another comment here. Oh, hello. I'll add another comment on this one for update score. You can see that my use of spaces is very inconsistent. I apologize for that. Try and cut out your use of spaces if you can. Because uh, you can create problems if you're not thinking. There we are. Reset game, update score. So far, so good. So at the moment, we can track the score, but we've got nothing yet telling the, the score to be counted when we break any of the blocks. And that's going to be the final stage of this particular step. We need to get that working. So let's compile and save the work we've done here. Make sure that everything's compiled and saved in the HUD as well. And the final place we need to go in this step is the block, since that is where the points are being counted. So in the event graph, at the moment we've got a destroy actor happening, but after we destroy it we also want to know how many points was that block worth and then we can add them onto the score. So there's going to, that's going to come after the destroy actor. So we're going to need to cast to our game mode since that's where the score has been counted. So cast to game mode and it's the BO game mode we want. And then objects always going to be get game mode, otherwise it won't work. And then as the game mode, we're going to update the score, which is what we want to happen. So the target points that we're going to add on, this is why we added this points to the custom event earlier. So we can remove points and we can add them on, uh, mostly for adding on actually. So what I'm going to do is get points. And this is going to convert to an integer because I had that as a float for some reason. That's not a problem. So that is now going to get those points and that's what's going to be added on when we update the score. So I'm going to compile and save that. So now's going to be a really good time to test this. So what I'm going to do is just play the game and I want to see the score being counted. So when I release the ball, as soon as it hits some blocks, that should start being counted, which it is, and it's also sending that to the HUD. So everything's working as intended. So at the moment, if I just let the ball go, we're not going to lose anything on the score and we're not going to lose any lives because we've not yet set those behaviours up. But that is what's coming in the next step. Now that we've got the score being counted, it's going up and we have got the right number of lives being tracked and that's all displayed in the HUD, which is beautiful. We now need to start taking things away. So when the ball goes beyond the paddle, we need to take a life and maybe some points as well. So let's get into that. So the first thing I'm going to do is what happens when we lose a life. So I'm going to go into the game mode and I'll create a new custom event and we're going to call that life lost. So this is what's going to happen when we lose a life. Oh, that's not good. Let's get the, ah, let's get the capitals in the right place. Life lost. So the first thing I want to do with this custom event is get it to update the score and we're just going to take some points away. So what we can do out of a custom event is call another custom event. So we're going to get the update score event and here in this point we can take some away. So let's go minus 500 for now. Let's be really harsh. 
If they didn't want to lose the points, they should have been more careful. What I also want to do now is create a new custom event for game over. So this is what's going to happen when all the lives are gone. So let's go custom event. And it's going to be called game over. Good stuff. So this game over event is going to be what we're going to do if the lives is zero or less than zero. So what we'll do then is when we lose a life, we need to check was that the last life basically. So let's get how many lives do we have. So we'll get lives and then we need to do a check. Is this equal to or less than zero? And then we'll do a branch out of there because this is our condition on the branch. And the question is, let's just move these over a little bit. So after we lose a life, we update the score, take 500 off, but then we want to know what's happening with the lives. And if it is or equal to zero or less than zero, then that will be true. And then we're just going to do game over. And that will run our game over script that we will set up. Okay, so now we know what's going to happen if this is true. If it's false, what we're going to want to do is take a life off. So our max lives are set to three. We're going to need to reduce that by one. And we're also going to need to display that on the HUD. So the first thing we'll do, we'll come out of false. Then we need to set the current lives. So we're going to set lives to whatever our lives was. And we're going to take one away from it. So let's get lives again. And then we're going to do an integer minus integer. And we're going to do one. So be careful with this one. Don't put minus one in there because we're already, it's a minus operation. So we're telling it to take one away. And then that's going to go into there. So we're setting the lives to lives minus one. So that should take three down to two. We're also going to get the heads up display. And as the heads up display, we also want to set points on that as well. And that is just going to be the result of that. So whatever we've just set the points to, set that on the hood as well. That should all be good. So game over. What I need to do for this one is just for now, it's kind of a placeholder, but we're just going to get it to quit the game. So whenever we lose all our lives and game over is called, it should just quit the game. So let's comment this game over. Get rid of the space and we'll comment this with life lost and that should all make sense but even though we put this beautiful script together this life lost script nothing yet is going to call it and that happens in the ball blueprint because that's where the current ball is being destroyed so let's open the BP ball up so here is where um, the ball is destroyed new ball when one is destroyed I've got it at the bottom of all my scripts and what I'll do is just create a little bit of new space. Move these all over to the side a little bit. Whoosh. And then what we need to do is talk to the game mode. So let's get the game mode. And from the game mode, we're going to run life lost. Like so. So let's just connect this in the middle. So before it creates a new ball, it's going to run this life lost script. So now let's give all this a test and see if it's going to behave itself, shall we? Ooh, right. So I'm just going to fire the ball. What we're looking for is that the points are removed. So it should take 500 points away, which is going to set it back to zero here. And we lose a life as well. That didn't work. Ah, OK, I know what I did. Right, silly Shane. Let's go back into the game mode. I'm setting points, not lives. You absolute mug, Shane. Delete that lives so we're going to set lives to the result of this okay hopefully this will be more successful now let's compile and test and we'll fire this off so again remove the points hopefully and take a live off we lost all the points and we're down to two lives brilliant let's try this again so now we're going to lose more points hopefully and we're going to lose another life. Yep. And we'll do this one more time. And here's the final one. Does game over work when we lose our last life? Not doing very well for points on this one, am I? Uh, 
Yay, it works. Okay, so that pretty much ties this step up. So what we've got working now is both counters, Live's counters are doing what they should. Live starts at three, goes down to zero, and then ends the game. The points will go up, but every time we lose a ball, we're going to lose 500 points. You can obviously change the mechanics of that if you want. Maybe you don't want to be so punishing, just take 100 points off. Maybe you want to start with more or less lives by changing your max lives variable. That's totally up to you. But that's going to do it for now. In the next step, we're going to be setting up a game over screen to make it a little bit clearer to the player that the game is in fact over. And then we wouldn't quit the application if we were running this on a phone. We would probably return back to a menu screen. But we're just going to go probably with game over message and then we'll just reset the game. So I'll see you in the next video for that. Now that we can make it so the player runs out of lives and there's a game over state, what we're going to have to do next is communicate that to the player. And we'll do that through our heads up display. So we'll go straight into our HUD, into the designer, and we're gonna put a game over message in the middle of the screen when all the lives have gone. So to get started with that, I'm gonna create a new text block. And what I want to do is anchor that to the center of the screen. And I'm gonna set the position X and the position Y to zero. But if you look, it's still not quite in the center. And the way that we're going to sort that out is this alignment. So if we do 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, that then puts it 50% on both axes along the way of the alignment, which ends up being centered. That's what we want. So that's now going to stay in the center. So for the text, we're going to want it to say game over. And I'm going to put that all in caps because I want this to look kind of old school. So we'll do that. I'm going to put a, a sad face in there. And I want to size the, the text block to the content to make sure the alignment stays where I want it. So that's a good start. We've now got it saying game over. But I don't think it's big enough. So let's get the, the size of the text a little bit bigger. And to do that, we're going to drop down this font section underneath appearance. And we, here we can change the font. If you've got other fonts installed, you can change them. Uh, what all I want to do here is change the size. So I'm gonna change the size to something like 60. Nice and big, make sure the player can't miss it. What we need to do next is put a behavior on this to make it invisible most of the time and only become visible when the player loses all their lives. And for that, we need to scroll down to behavior and you'll see there's a visibility section and we can bind some behavior to that. So I'm gonna click on bind and then go to create binding. And then the return node is interested in whether or not it's gonna be visible, hidden, or whatever. So we need to set that up. But we're just gonna leave this here for now because before we can get the text to be shown or not shown, we need something to trigger it. So we're gonna to have to go back into the game mode, set up a game over variable, and we're gonna use that variable to then trigger whether or not the text shows. So let's get the game mode open. Here's my BO game mode. Here's all the scripts I've got in here so far. And the first thing I want to do is just create a new variable and it's going to be called game over question mark is it game over and we'll save that and it's automatically coming as a boolean which is what I want because this state is going to be either true or false and then what I'll do is compile this because I want the default state of this to be false and we can see that it currently is set to false so I'll leave it like that we want this not to be the text the game over text we want it not to be on screen at the beginning of the game. So anytime we start a new game, we want to make sure that this script is also set to false. So here's our reset game script. And the last thing I want to do now is after we've reset everything else, we're also going to set the game over to false. So every time we start a new game, it's no longer game over. And whenever it's game over, we need to set the game over variable to true. So what we're going to do is get game over here and we're going to set it to true whenever game over happens. And then what we'll do is add a delay of five seconds so let's just set that to five before it quits the game and we're going to change this quit game I think in the next step to just resetting the game so we don't have to exit the application. 
but that should do it. So game over should be the only thing that sets the game over to true. Everything else should be setting it to false. So we'll compile that. And that will mean that now, from our heads up display, we can use that game state to de decide whether or not this should be visible or not. So we already set this up previously so we can get to the game mode. So let's get the game mode. And then out of here, I want to get game over. We need to know what that is. And then that's going to become a condition on what to show. So what we want to do is, is game over equal to something? There we go. So if game over is set to true, then we want to return visible. And we're going to go backwards a little bit on this one. And out of here, we're going to create a select. There it is. And what this is going to do is that if this is set to true, we are going to have this be visible. So what we're going to do is plug the result of this into the index. And that gives us basically, is it true or false? So if it is false, we want it to be hidden. If it becomes true, make it visible. And that's all we're doing to set this particular bit of the heads up display up. So now we need to run out of lives and test if this is working. So let's compile and save. I'm gonna play. And now I'm gonna lose some lives. Okay, so I'm down to my last life. So now I've just released the ball. When this ball comes back down, my hope is that it will tell me it's game over, which it is. It'll wait five seconds and then it will close the app. Hey, and everything worked. So that brings us successfully to the end of another step. Well done for getting this far. You're doing very well at this. You're making a game. Wow, well done. So in the next one, what we're gonna be doing, according to my notes, is setting up the reset game. So what that will entail is just when we lose all our lives, instead of quitting the app, we'll reset it. It's a quick step, but it's one that we need to do. So I'll see you for that one. We now have a game over state set up for the game and we are communicating that to the player. We're leaving the message on screen for a little while and then we're having the, the application quit. And what we're gonna do now is just make that game over state, the actions that we do at game over a little bit better. And we'll start with making it so that no new balls are spawned once it's game over, just cause it will look better. And to do that, we're gonna go into the paddle, the player paddle. And that's because this is where spawn ball is happening. And what we're going to do is set a condition on this so that the ball will only be spawned if game over isn't true. So what we need to do, first of all, is get the game mode. And as we've done in previous blueprints, we've not got it as a variable here. So we'll set that up. So up here, on begin play, before I do new ball, I'm going to get game mode. And I'm going to make that a variable. So we'll do cast to game mode. And that's going to be our BO game mode, just as it's been every other time. And under object, we want to do get game mode. Lovely. And then as game mode, come out of here and we're going to promote that to a variable. And we're going to call that variable game mode. Let's get rid of the space chain. There we go. And we're just going to set that up there. And then we'll do new ball. So. Let's comment this up a little bit. So this little area here is getting the game mode. And that gives us a new ball. I don't need to comment that, it's, it's already there. So now here, we have access to the game mode. So what we'll do is go to the game mode and we'll get it. And then out of that, we need to get the game over variable. We really need to know if it's true or false, don't we? And that then is going to feed a branch. So let's get a branch. And our condition of the branch is, is it game over? So if it is game over, we actually don't want to do anything. So I'm going to disconnect this. So I'm going to hold Alt and just click on that wire. And we're only going to move forward in this script if that is set to false. If it's not game over, we can spawn balls. But if it is, no spawning, no balls. Ixnay on the balls, eh? I think that's right. So, that's pretty good. We've got to check on that. 
Now what we want to do is make it so that the game resets instead of quitting. And that's in our game mode, I believe. Yep, so we're currently set to quit game. I don't want to quit anymore. I want to reset the game. I'll do that by just loading the level again. So after the delay, I'm going to do open level. And here you can type the name of the level. And we can see here that mine's called level one and you need to get this typed exactly right. So capital L, E, V, E, L, and then the number one for me. And that should work. So let's compile that. Make sure that I compiled my paddle as well, which I didn't. Let's save everything. And we need to give that a test. So I'll just cut out the bit where I lose most of the lives and then I will see you when it's time to lose the last life. Okay, so here's the last life. So what we're hoping for then is that when this life loses, no new ball spawns and the level after five seconds will reset. So game over's there, no new ball. Let's reload the level. Hey, <laughs> there we go. We've got a game, guys. Okay, so that's kind of it then for the nuts and bolts of it to get us up to the kind of prototype stage. Now, we've got something that functions as a simple breakout game. What that means though, is that going forward, we can spend a little bit more time on making this pretty and then some new features. So if you cast your mind back to step one, I showed you that we're gonna have a bit of a castle. We'll have um, walls that we can knock down. The ball's gonna be visible when it goes behind things. It's just gonna be good. So moving forward, it's gonna be the fun stuff. All the things that I think are fun, not that this hasn't been fun, but everything's just been black and white and boring. So let's make it more beautiful. -er. Yes, let's do that. Now that the functionality of the game's basically where we want it to be, now we can start having a little more fun and making this thing look prettier. And the first thing we'll need to do for that is to bring in some more of the assets that we're going to use for the project. So we're going to theme it to look like a... I don't know what the area of the world's called, like a valley maybe and that's where the ball is going to bounce around we're going to put a castle in there and we're going to smash the castle up it's going to be wonderful but first of all we need those assets so let's go to we have a static meshes folder so we're going to go in there and we're going to import if you are using my shared files if you've got access to that via patreon or if you've got access to the ue4 breakout folder by clicking the link in the video description then you should see breakout assets and breakout tutorial the tutorial folder is just this project that we're currently working on and the assets live here and we're going to be looking in the static meshes folder and you can see a lot of these we already have so the ball block and bounds we already have as we do with the paddle but the others so the castle gate the cliffs cliffs and cliffs the grass and also the tower and wall we need to bring all of those in so i'm going to select them all at once do a mass import and click on open and then here we just need to make sure we do one check. So the mesh section, it might be contracted like that. Make sure you expand it. And we're looking within here. You could also maybe need to click on this bit as well. Within here, we're looking for this option, combine meshes. Make sure that that is enabled because it's very possible that when I've made these meshes, they were made up of multiple meshes within the file. And if that's the case, we need to combine them to stop things getting confusing. So once you've done that, you can click on import. They will then all come in, or I can just click on import all. You may then see this error message. Don't worry about it. It's just because I didn't worry too much about my models being perfect because they're just simple models and it makes no impact on what we're going for. So I'll ignore that error. And then we have these objects that have all come in. I'm just gonna save all to get rid of that asterisk, which means that then if the project crashes, I'm not gonna lose anything. And then what we can do is have a look at some of these. So let's go to castle gate. Here's what it is. You can see some of them have multiple material slots and it's all of the ones that are going to become destructible later will have multiple material slots. If it's not going to be destructible, such as the cliffs, that should just have one material slot. Like that. And we're going to put a material on the ones with one material slot first. So I'm just going to close that for now. I'm going to go up to content and into my materials folder and we need to import a texture file. So let's go to import and then back to the breakout assets. Here's my textures folder and it's just the color palette.tg. I'm going to use the target file for this. Open that and then make sure I save it. And that's going to be used in the material. So let's right click, create a new material. I'm going to call it M underscore palette. So what this material, as you can see, 
is it's what we call a texture atlas. So I've put all the colors that I want to use in one file. And you can see I left myself some space around here if I wanted to do any other colors. But these are the ones I ended up using. I think I used some of the white down here as well. And that means that we can have lots of colors on an object without having to use multiple materials. So let's open up this palette material. I'll just put the main material node for the palette over here. And then what I need to do is you can see here's my preview. We're going to put in the texture that we just brought in. So I'll right click and I'm going to create a texture sample node. Texture. And there it is listed. Or if you want the texture sample node, you can also just hold T on your keyboard and left click and that'll create one too. So let's just close that. And then the texture that I want to use is just here. I'm going to choose color palette. That's the only one that we should have available. So we'll click on that. And then I'm going to connect that to base color. And then after a little while, when it catches up, you'll see that the preview of the material goes here. And you also get a preview of the finished material added to a sphere over there. So there's a couple of other things I want to do with this material. One of them is just to add the texture sample into the emissive color. And that just means it will kind of emit its own light. So we don't have to worry about lighting if we don't want to. Which will also mean that it will run a lot more efficiently on lower end hardware. And then the final thing is I want it to be rough. I don't want this to be shiny at all. And the way I'm going to achieve that is by adding a constant to the roughness. And I'm going to set that number to 1. 1 being completely rough, 0 being not rough at all. And now I'm going to save that material and I'm going to start adding it to some of my assets. So I'm going back into my static meshes folder. And then, as I said, all the ones that will be destructible later won't get this material, but the cliffs definitely will. So let's open one of the cliff pieces at an angle we can see. And then up in the material slot here, I'm going to just choose M underscore palette. And then that color should be kind of nice. I might go back and just take the emissive down because I'm not a massive fan of that. So let's just go back into my palette. And so the emissive at the moment is stronger than I would like. So I'm going to multiply that by a number just so it's not too strong. So let's add a multiply node. And the result of the multiply will be what goes into the emissive color. A will be this. And then B is going to be another constant. And I'm going to set this to quite a low number. Let's try 0 0.1. Hopefully that's better. So I'll save it. And then go back to my cliffs. And yeah, now we can see a little bit more of the kind of low poly look. Some of the triangles showing up. So that's kind of nice. Nice. Okay, so that's the first one done. Let's get cliffs 2. We'll add the same material. Palette. Let's see if we like the look of that. Yep. Save that. We're going to do cliffs corner. Add the material again. Yep, that's looking good. We'll save that one. We need to do the grass. Yep, looking good. And there should be one more that I've somehow not imported, so I'll do that now. So back into static meshes, and I missed the ground. Let's import that. So yeah, all the settings should be fine. Open that up, add my palette, and save. Okay, so I'm done with all these now. I can close them. And if we have a look in here, these now all show that they've got colors on them. So the pieces that will be destructible castle pieces, they need to be put together using a different material. Otherwise, um, when we destruct them, it won't get the right colors. They'll look really odd. We won't like it. So we'll create one master material for those that we can easily change the color of. So back into my materials folder. And I'm just going to call this material M underscore destructible. Destructible, I think it is. Destructible. Okay, and we'll open that one up. And this is going to be put together in a very similar way. But in the base color, we're going to use a vector parameter. And that will allow us to change the color easily. And we're just going to call it base color. That's nice and easy. And I'm going to have it set up in the same way as my other material. So the roughness is going to be a constant of one. So we'll set that up. And then I'm going to have a multiply. 
that goes into emissive color, that's going to go into A, and a constant's going to go into B, and that's going to be set to 0 0.1, just like I did with the palette material. Okay, so that's basically built, but this color's not right yet. Okay, so to get the color for the base color, I'm just going to cheat a little bit because I want it to match up with what's in our palette. So what I will do for that is I'll open the palette up and I'll just bring it in as a smaller window and then I'm going to go back into my destructible color here. So I'm just going to put it out of the way and then click on my base color, go to this here to select the color, the color picker. Here's the eyedropper tool and then I should just be able to mouse over that and I can choose. So the destructibles are made up of these three different shades of gray. So I'm going to start with the darkest gray and then I can click on OK and I can close that for now. And that will just set up the darkest one of the three colors. And that's done for now, so I'll save this. And then I'm going to close the destructible material for now. And I'll close the palette as well for the time being. And then this M underscore destructible, I need to create three material parameters from. So let's do right click, create material instance. And then this M underscore destructible material, I need to create three material instances from, which means that I've only got one main material, which is more efficient, but I can make small changes to it. So let's right click on here, create material instance, and I'm going to call this M underscore destructible one. And we'll do the same, create material instance. And this one's going to be M underscore destructible two. And then the next one, can you guess what I'm going to call it? M underscore destructible four. <laughs> I'm just kidding, destructible three. <laughs> I am so funny. Right, so the first color is actually fine because it's the, the dark color. So that one's okay. I'm just going to drop that there for now. But this one's going to need the next color. So what I'll do is just open this color palette again so I can get to it. And then here's base color. I can click on here, get my eyedropper, and there's the second of the color. So I'll click on that, and then I can click on OK and save that one. That gives me two colors. And then destructible three, which should be this one, I'll do the same thing with, turn on base color, click on here, get my colored sampler, and then get that color. And then click on OK, save, I should be able to close that now and you can see that hopefully I have three different colors and I can now add these three colors to my destructible meshes or the meshes that will become destructible. So let's start with Castle Gate. So the material should have um, a slot. So I've got color two and color three. So that tells me which one that I want to use on them. That's why I named them this way. So we've got destructible two and destructible three. There you go, that looks pretty nice. So that's that one done, let's save it. And then I need to open up tower. And again, it tells me color two, color three, and color one on this one. So I'll put color one on here, destructible one, color two on this one, destructible two, and color three is destructible three. And then hopefully as we move around it, we can see that we've got tower bits, we've got darker windows, a lighter bit on top. That looks pretty cool. Save that one. And then the final one is the wall that should have darker colored bricks on it. And that's using color one and color two. So let's have destructible one, which is the brick color, and destructible two, which is the rest of the castle wall. Okay, let's save that. I can now close all of these other windows. I don't need them. I've got all my assets set up and ready to build another block out of the level with, which is what we'll do in the next step. Now I've got all the assets in, materials made and assigned, we can do another block out of the level, put a castle in there, something to smash up. So I'll see you in the next step for that. Right then, now that we've got all of our assets and materials in and made and assigned, we can start doing something with them. So we're going to do another level block out and we'll probably do it over two steps. In this step, we're going to put in the ground and the cliffs and get the kind of play space done. And then in the next one, we'll put the castle together as well. And then we'll have something to work with 
and then we'll start making things destructible and assigning blueprints to them again. So the first thing we need to do in this one then is get a ground in place, which I'm going to start with. So if we go into our static meshes folder, here is ground. And what I'll do is just I'm going to drop it anywhere. And then I need to set the location to 0, 0, 0. And then I'm going to put it in the corner. In fact, I'm going to bring it back a little bit as well. So I'm going to put it over here. So it's kind of lined up with that back corner. And then I'm going to scale it. So I'm going to make it wider than the play area and then longer than the play area. And that will mostly do it for the ground. There is one more little thing that we need to do. And I'll try and show you what it is. So if I send the ball off, you should be able to see as it gets into the distance um, that half the ball is sitting underneath the ground, which is going to look weird. Especially when we start adding shadows and things, that's going to look all kinds of odd, which we don't want. And we need to calculate exactly how far to drop the ground to make sure that it's underneath the ball. And thankfully, that's easy to do. If we click on the ball here or hover over the ball, you can see the approximate size is 50 by 50 by 50. So if it's halfway through, the, the ground is cutting halfway through, then we only need to drop it half of the, the height of the ball to get it in place, which means 25 basically. So we'll select the ground and then Z in Unreal Engine is the height. So we're going to go minus 25 on the location Z and that should be perfect. We'll just play it first of all, make sure that the ball doesn't look like it's going underneath the ground. Nope, that looks good. Okay, so I'm happy with the placement of the ground. Happy days. Next thing I want to do is get some of the cliffs in place. Now remember, we're going to keep this bounds here. This is what everything's going to bounce off. It's already doing a fantastic job. So what we'll do is we'll put some cliffs there for decoration, but they won't collide. They're just there to make things look pretty. So I'll start with cliffs one, and I'm going to make the position zero, zero, zero. So let's set that one to zero and then that one to zero and that one to zero. And then I'm not particularly happy with the scale of this. I'm not sure why I made it to this scale, but it's smaller than I want. And the scale that I like with these assets is 2.5 times bigger. So 2.5 tab, 2.5 tab, 2.5. And the reason I like that is because you should see that that now perfectly lines up with the grid lines, which makes snapping much easier. And I'll try and show you this. So I'm going to change my location snaps to 500, I believe is right. Mm, it will be. So if we move it there, you'll see it now snaps to grid points. But I'm actually going to need to move it slightly different. So let's just change that back to 100 for a second. And it needs to be there. And then I'll change my snaps back to 500. And as I make copies, it will snap them in place. So if I hold Alt on my keyboard and move it, that'll create a copy. And it'll just put it there. And I'm going to leave that as it is for now. I want the gap there because I'm going to bring in Cliffs 2, which is going to fill in that gap. So that's that one done. Let's bring in Cliffs 2. And then we need to change the scale again to... 2.5, 2.5, 2.5. Change the location to 0, 0, 0. And then I'm going to put these in position. So I know that that needs to go there. I'll change my snaps back to 100 so I can get the depth of this right. They now look like they're lining up. I'll go back to 500. Hold Alt to make a copy and drag into place. That looks pretty tidy. I'm happy with that. So I'm just going to keep those there for now, I think. In fact, I might just do one more copy of this one. Alt and there. And then I should be able to put the corner piece in just there. So let's bring that in. Same again. 2.5 tab, 2.5 tab, 2.5. Get that in place. And then position 0, 0, 0. And then it's just a case of putting this exactly where I want it to be. So I'll change my snaps back to 100 for this. And that looks pretty good. So you can see that all of these pieces should fit together. It's a modular kit that I created. Although, weirdly, although these fit together perfectly in um, Maya, there is a bit of a weird join there. But we won't be able to see that in-game, so it's not a problem. Uh, it just upsets me a little bit. But anyway, that's fine. 
I might also, uh, I think the colour's slightly off on this one, but I will fix that in the texture for download time. So don't worry about that. It might look weird on mine, but look much better on yours. So don't you worry. Anyway, there's that first side done. And we could just place the other pieces on the other side by hand, or we could be a little bit smarter than that and select them all. So I'm just holding shift while I select them. I'm gonna hold alt and just drag them over here. And that red arrow there indicates that I've just moved them on the x-axis. So the x-axis is what I need to change the scale. If I go to minus 2.5, what that will do is invert it, which is perfect for what I want, because then I can just bang that in place. And I've now got two sides. Might be a little bit too symmetrical, but it will do the job. And then I've just got a little gap here that needs filling which I'll just fill with this one. So hold Alt. I'm going to turn my Rotate tool on, which you can do by clicking here, or I'm going to hold E on my keyboard, press A on my keyboard to open that. And then I'm going to rotate it by 90 degrees. And then I'll leave my snaps on 100 for this and just get it to line up. And you should notice that it doesn't fit perfectly. That's overlapping a little bit. And that's more my own poor planning than anything else. But it is an easy fix. So I'll just put my Scale tool on by pressing R. And I'm going to scale it in. And you can see there, that's when it perfectly matches. So I'm going to put that in there. And that's my level done. Although, <laughs> I did forget to press Alt when I copied it. So let's get um, another copy of this. So put my Move tool on, hold Alt, and I'll put that back in place. There we go, Shane. Beautiful. So we're almost there. Let's see what that looks like. So we're getting there. I'm, you know, I'm a little bit soul destroyed about that join. I will find a way to fix it, don't worry. The assets that you download will probably be fixed, uh, will probably have that fixed. So don't worry, it's just upsetting me. <sighs> anyway, that's okay. The only problem is, let's just go back to play, this black area up here, and then we need to turn off this so you can't see it anymore. I think what I also want to do is just shift everything along one. So I'm gonna select all the cliff pieces because we can't see any of the white here, which suggests that the uh, the collision's not gonna look right. So I'm gonna drop my snaps down to 50 now, just so it's just intersecting that line there. So that's better, that's pretty much lined up where I want it to be. And just in case, I'm just gonna set my snaps back to 500, hold Alt, and I'm just gonna snap, oh, that didn't work, hold Alt, and then make a copy just so that that's going to be covered up. I don't want the, the end of the world to be present. So that's pretty nice. So this black area up here needs something doing with it as well. And the way I'm going to do that is with another piece of ground. I'm just going to bodge it really, but it will be fine. So I'm going to set the location to 0, 0, 0 just to get me started. And then I want the scale to be wider much wider than the, the kind of play space. That's pretty nice. And then the height is going to need to be fairly big as well. So let's do that. And now what I'll do is bring this back. Try and get the height to line up. Not quite. So I'm going to change my snaps back down to 50 now. And I'm going to rotate this by just 10 degrees. And the idea being that this will intersect where the cliffs are and look like it kind of becomes a hill. That's the idea. So I just need to move that up a touch. That looks pretty good. That intersects just about in the right place. So this doesn't need to be positioned ultra perfectly, but close enough. And then what I need to do is just make a copy of this. So I'm gonna put my rotate tool on, hold Alt on my keyboard, and then rotate it around to create a copy. I might just need to make it a bit taller on this axis. And then I'm gonna drop this into place on the side as well. That looks pretty good. Does that join about right? It does. Then what I need to do is make one more copy, Alt, drag it over here. And now what I need to do is just take that rotation off of it so that I can just flip the scale 
So we're going to go minus this number on the y-axis, I think I need. It might be the x-axis view, depending on which way you rotated. And then I'm going to rotate that back 10 degrees and just put that into place as well. And then hopefully when we play it, that looks like a full game world. So this is pretty good so far. If we play it, the ball looks like it's bouncing off the right place. That's pretty good. There's one last thing to do then, and that's to hide the game bounce so that we can't see it in game. So I'm just going to select it, scroll down in my details panel, and under rendering, I want actor hidden in game tick. You can also, if you want to, tick that so you don't see it in the editor. That's your choice. I'll leave it on for now. I'll get rid of it later. And then we'll play again. And now when we throw the ball into the level, it should look like it's bouncing off the cliffs, which it does. Okay, so that's it for this step. That gets us started. One thing that you might notice is that there is a difference between the colors that we're seeing in the editor and the colors in game. They're darker in game. And that's because I'm currently in an unlit mode in here. If we go to lit, they will look identical. There we go. So that's just something that might be bugging you. I just thought I'd point that out now. But that brings us to the end of this step. In the next step, we'll repeat kind of what we've done here, but we'll build a castle. And then we'll be ready to start getting the gameplay working on that as well. So I'm looking forward to it. I'll see you there. Now that we've got our level, our world kind of built, next thing to do is get the castle in there. Which again, I've taken a modular approach on building this so that you can build different shaped castles if you wanted. You could make it bigger, smaller. I'm going to create a really basic one, but you can, if you want to, build something a little bit more ambitious. That's your choice. I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. So first thing I'll do, I'm just going to switch this back to unlit so it's a little bit easier to see what I'm doing. And then I'm going to start putting assets in. So I'm going to start with the gate, which is going to be kind of the centre of the castle. So I'm just going to drop that roughly in the middle and then I'm going to set everything to zero. And we'll see where that's ended up. We're going to push that back a little bit. And that should fit perfectly because we've already dropped the floor down so that everything should match up. So I'm going to put the front of the castle about here and at the moment I've got my snap set to 50. I modelled all the pieces of castle to fit 100 so if we want something to kind of fit together nicely 50 snaps is pretty good. So I'm going to put the first piece of castle there, the gate's going to go at the front, I'm just having one gate on this. And then what I want is a piece of wall, there we go. And I want to just get that to sit on the ground as well and then line up with the gate, which should be like that. That should fit perfectly. Then we're just gonna put three pieces of castle on either side of the gate, just to get us going. So there we go, that's pretty nice. Now what we need are some towers at the corners. So let's bring in a tower. Uh, try and get that on the ground if I can. There we go, and then drop this into place which should be roughly on the corner so let's just put it there for now and make sure we've got no gap yep that's cool i'm going to hold alt on my keyboard so that when i move it, it copies it put it over to the other side that looks pretty good pretty symmetrical nice and then what i want to do is just select everything apart from the gate i don't need the gate and i'm going to move this back so I'm building the back of the castle as well. So two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Hopefully I've moved that back far enough. I'm going to put seven pieces of wall in here. So we'll see. I might have to move it in a second. So we'll just fill that gap in with another piece of castle wall. Very good. And then I'm going to take a piece of castle wall. I'm going to rotate it by 90 degrees. And then drop this in place over here. Where are we? About there. Let's make sure that that looks right. Yep, that is pretty lined up. And then we'll create some copies of that. Three, four, five, six. Do you know what? It's only six instead of seven. It's not going to be perfectly square, this castle. But that will do. I also need to just make a copy of that because I've forgotten to actually duplicate it again. And then we'll get these six pieces of wall and we'll drop them over on the other side. So I'm holding Alt to copy again or to duplicate. There we go. 
and that builds the castle. Now, you'll notice that it all looks really repetitive, but what you can do if you want to is pick some pieces of the wall and then let's just work out which axis we need to go on. It's the y-axis. If we set that to minus one, the bricks are different on the other side, so we can add a little bit of variety like that. It doesn't really matter too much. Don't spend too much time getting your castle perfect, because at some point you're going to replace this with new assets that are actually blueprints. So all this really is, is blocking it out, making sure that we like the layout. So let's have a look. I like the size and position. Um, the, the collision should work, but obviously nothing will disappear or get destroyed just yet. So that's fine. So what I want to do now is put some of these blocks inside. Now I might replace these with something later, but for now, what I want to do is just get rid of the ones that won't fit inside. So these ones on the end are definitely not going to fit. Oops, deleted some more. Don't do that. And probably these aren't going to fit either. So I'll get rid of these. And then the remaining ones, I'm going to pop inside the castle. So all of these should be the remaining blocks. I'm just going to pull these forward. And that's pretty nice. That's the, the treasure inside the castle for now. Let's just have another look. Do we like the look of that? I think we do. Everything is working beautifully. So that is now the level block out basically done. We've now got the world, the new world, the, the little valley that the castle sits in. We've got a castle and we've put our blocks inside so they're being protected by the castle as well. What we need to do next is add a little bit of lighting to this level and we're also going to put some of the grass in and around just to decorate it a little bit and that'll kind of cover the whole look of the level for now. So I will see you in the next step for that. Now we're going to do a little bit more decoration, making it look pretty before moving on to some more blueprinting. And in this case, we're going to add a little bit of lighting to make it look nicer and some little tufts of grass just, just to make it look a bit more visually interesting. So at the moment, we've got this um, awful unlit view. So if I change it to lit, it doesn't look much better. So I'm going to improve that by adding a directional light. So we can get a directional light by going over to lights in our modes panel. And here is directional light up at the top. And we're just going to drop one of those in there. And you'll see that straight away, it makes the whole game look like arse. So we're going to have to make some changes to improve that. And I'm going to start with changing the intensity to 4. Which will really help. It doesn't blow out the colours so much. You might choose a different number. You might prefer 3. Maybe you want it a little bit. In fact, maybe I prefer 3. I'll leave it on 3 for now. And then what I'm going to do is change here. So I could change the colour of the light by doing this. But I don't want to do that. I'm just going to use temperature instead. And then I can drag the temperature down a little bit towards the warmer end of the spectrum to give it a kind of an end of the day sort of feel. Next thing I want to do is work on the shadows a little bit. I'm not a massive fan of these shadows down here, which I'll get rid of in a minute. But what I do want to do is make sure that all shadows in my game are dynamic. And I'll do that by changing the light to movable. And you'll notice a little change in the shadows. And that means that it won't pre-calculate shadows. This is fine for us because we're only going to have things that need to cast shadows, casting shadows. And for everything else, we'll just turn it off. And we'll start doing that with the cliffs in a minute. But first of all, I'm just going to try and choose a nicer angle for my light to be shining. So I'll just have my light selected with my rotate tool. And I'll make sure that the, the light sits in the front of the castle. And then maybe... Oh, not like that. And then maybe I will just change the angle a little bit there as well. That's kind of nice. I like that. Okay, next thing then. I don't want ugly shadows coming off this side of the the valley. It just doesn't look nice. So the way I'm going to get rid of them is I'm going to select all the cliffs from my world outliner. So that's all of them. And then in my details panel, I'm just going to type shadows to help me find it. And there's cast shadow. They're all casting a shadow. Let's turn that off. It makes everything look a little bit neater. And it's also saving some resources, so that's good. And I'll just press Escape to deselect all of those. So now I'm fairly happy with my lighting. I'll just have a quick look at it in-game. Yeah, that's not bad. I might make some changes later just to stop some of the shadows being too harsh. Um, but the overall colour of the the environment and the, the landscape, I like. So I'll keep that as it is for now. Next thing I'll do then is add some of these tufts of grass, which we've got here. 
and I'm going to do that using the foliage tool. So the foliage tool lives up here. We'll turn it on and the first thing we can do is drop some foliage here. So we'll put our grass in there and then we'll get all different settings that we can change. But first of all, we're going to have to update our static mesh for the ground because if you look at the moment, we can paint on these top of the cliffs, which is good. I want to do that. But there's a problem when we try to paint on the ground or any of the ground pieces up here. And it's to do with the way that the collisions are set up. So we just need to turn collisions on for a minute to allow us to paint and then we can turn them back off. So let's just do that now. Let's find all my pieces of ground. There they all are. And then I'm going to look for the collision bit here. And there are multiple values because I've messed around. You should have it set to project default. Uh, but I'm just going to make sure that block all is turned on for now. And then I can go back to my foliage tool. And when I drag my brush around, it should allow me to paint everywhere. There we go. That's a good sign. Now we can set up some of the settings on the, the brush and on the, the foliage to get it ready to paint. So the first thing I want is actually quite a small brush. So I'm just going to use my square brackets to size that down to something like that. I only want small little tufts in a few places, so I don't want to overdo it. I'm also going to put the paint density up at 1 and make sure the static meshes is ticked there. Then we'll click on the grass here and we can make some changes. Let's just make a bit more room. Make some changes here. So the density there is fine. I'll set the radius to 100. That stops them from appearing too close together. Scaling uniform is good. I want them to be a bit bigger, so 2 and 2.5. So the smallest grass will be two times the original and the largest grass will be two and a half times the original. That's fine. I don't want to align to normals on this because I want the grass to pretty much point up. So I'll turn that off uh, because this is at an angle up here. So I don't want that to, to happen. And also these are all funny angles on the cliffs as well. So we won't do that. I do want random yaw and I'll set a random pitch angle of five just to add a bit of variation. I don't want the grass to cast any shadow, so I'll turn that off, otherwise it could look very messy. Make sure no collision is on, and that should do it. And then it's just up to you to put some little bits of grass around your level. So, just to make it look a little bit prettier. And the thing about this grass that looks good, or that I think looks good, is when we make it look kind of really pixel arty later, That'll look really cool. So let's just have a little look at that in game. Yeah, that looks okay. Maybe I've overdone it a little bit, but I'm a maverick. Sometimes I get a bit out of control, but that'll do nicely for now. I quite like that. Maybe I need to soften the light a little bit, but that looks pretty good. Okay. So that's going to do it for this step. We've now got better lighting. We've got dynamic lighting as well. So the shadow is going to be nice and dynamic. We've also got a bit of decorative grass in there. We're now ready to make it so that the pieces of castle wall and the towers, etc., when we hit them, they'll disappear so that we can get into the treasure on the inside. So I'll see you in the next step for that. Now it's time to get these pieces of wall and the gate and the tower to start disappearing when they're hit, just like the blocks do. And to do that, we're pretty much going to follow the same process. We're just using a different static mesh. So I'm going to go into my blueprints folder. And I'm going to do it for the wall, seeing as that's the, there are more pieces of wall than anything else. So let's go for Blueprint Class. And I'm going to go for an actor. And I'm going to call this BP underscore block, because it's now uh, a block piece, but it's a wall variant of that. So that's my name for it, BP underscore block underscore wall. Let's get that open. And then the first thing we need to do is add that static mesh to it. So we're going to add component, it's going to be a static mesh. There we go, and we'll call it wall so I know what it is. And then, static mesh over here, I can choose the wall, hopefully. There we go. I'm just going to check for the placement of the pivot. Yep, that's perfect. So far, so good. And then the next thing we're going to do is really, really important. If you don't do this, it won't work. We're going to be making this disappear when it gets hit. And you need to make sure that hit events are being generated. And I'll show you what I mean. If I scroll down here on the right hand side, here is collision. So you can see here it says simulation generates, but we can't see what all of that is. If we just move that over, simulation generates hit events. So unless we tick that box, hit will do nothing. So let's make sure that that's ticked. Next up, we need to go into the event graph for this. And we don't want any of those. Let's delete them. What we do want, I'm going to right click on 
the wall, go to add event, and it's on component hit. And then the first thing, when something hits it, we need to check, was that the ball that hit it? Because it's only the ball that we want to destroy this. So we're going to cast to the ball. There we go. BP underscore ball. That'll do nicely. And we're going to use that to see if that was the other actor. Was that the thing that hit the wall? And if that was the case, let's destroy the actor. So we'll drag out of there. Destroy actor. And that should do it. Let's compile that. And we'll give it a tiny little test. So we now have this here. Now, unfortunately, I don't know of a way of just replacing this static mesh with the blueprint. If I go BP underscore, it doesn't show up. If anybody does know a way of doing that, give me a shout. That would change my life. So what I'm going to have to do is delete these pieces of wall. So let's just put my um, a better tool on. So let's delete these for now. And I'm going to bring in my BP underscore block underscore wall. There it is. And then it's just a case of getting this into place. Now, hopefully my snaps still mean that it should yeah, automatically go to where I want it. And then I'll hold Alt and I will create some copies of this. Okay, so now I've just done the front row. So it's going to be a good time to check that this is behaving as intended. So let's hit play. And I just want to hit something at the front and middle. Oh, that's not a good shot. There you go. That's disappeared. So that's now behaving as intended. All we need to do now is replace all of the wall pieces with this blueprint. And then I'm going to start letting you go out on your own a little bit now. You need to create two more blueprints that function exactly the same. So you're going to do another one for the tower. So I would call that BP underscore block underscore tower. And I would make sure that I do all the same steps that we just did for the wall. You might want to also invert some of these pieces of wall or these new blueprints. So I think it's this one. If we do minus one on that, we can flip it around so we get different brick arrangements. But fair warning, there's every chance that we're going to replace these again when we move up to the destructible meshes. So the ones that actually break apart. So don't spend too much time making this look pretty because it could all be for nothing. So that wraps up this step. Make sure that you spend the time to get all of the other pieces of wall disappearing. And then I will see you in the next step. Hopefully, you've now got all of your different pieces of castle turned into blueprints that will disappear when you play the game. So what you should have, like I've got here, I've got BP underscore block wall, which is fine. That one all works. And then basically just a copy of it, which is BP underscore block underscore tower and BP underscore block underscore gate. And I've just replaced those in my level. You can see some of the little blueprint icons showing below them. And what I want to show you is that this works, but also I'm showing you something else. So if I just begin the game from here, you should see that they are disappearing, but I'm hoping to demonstrate something else. And that is when the ball goes behind the castle, it's really easy for the player to lose it. I can't see where it is now, so I can't be positioning my paddle in anticipation of where the ball is going to come back out. And that's going to get even worse once we start having these meshes destruct and there's crazy crap flying all over the place. So we need to do something to help the player out here to give them a way of seeing the ball when it's behind some of the meshes. And that's what this step's all about. So we're going to do that a really kind of cheap, nasty, dirty, easy way, but it will do exactly what we want. We're going to do it through the use of another material, one that always appears on top which will be perfect for our users. So what I'm going to do is go into my materials folder first of all and create a new material. And I'm going to call this material M underscore ball trans... Can I spell translucent? Translucent. Is that right or is it just a C? Translucent. I'll change it later if I realise it's wrong. I hate spelling things wrong. Anyway, let's open this up. And this is going to be a really simple material to put together. And the trick is we're going to disable a depth test. And that's going to make sure that it always appears on top. So we're going to set it to a white color. So I'm just going to use a constant 3 vector for that. There it is. And to be fair, I could also just use a constant for this. But I might want to change the color later. So we'll just set that to white for now. 
Then what I want to do is make sure that I've got um, opacity available to me. So I'm going to change the blend mode of the material to translucent. And then you'll see opacity becomes available. So I'm going to put a constant into there. There we go, a lovely little constant. And I'm going to set that to 0 0.4. And that's just going to be that we've almost got like a, a ghostly version of the ball behind things. It's not going to be fully there. So that's good. That's pretty much the material done. The last thing we need to do is click on the main material node. We're going to scroll down to the translucency section. We need to drop down here for the advanced options. And this area here, disable depth test, tick that box. That's what will make this material show above everything else. Then we can save this material and go and add it to our ball blueprint. So let's now go to the ball. Here it is. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm actually going to add another ball and have it slightly smaller inside the ball because I don't want to change the material that's on the ball. That's got our physics material on it. So I don't want to mess with that. We're just going to add another version of it inside. So what I'm going to do is add a new component, which is going to be a static mesh. There we go. It's going to be called see-through ball. And let's find the ball in here. There it is. And now I've got another copy of that ball selector. But what I'm going to do is turn my scale tool on and just scale that down slightly. Um, I want to scale it down not as much as that. So I'm going to change my snaps down to this one. And there we go. So that's just inside the ball slightly. And then this new copy of the ball is going to have not M underscore basic. It's going to have M underscore ball translucent. And we won't really see anything happening here. It's only in game that we'll really be able to see that happening. So let's compile and save this. Go back out into our game and we'll give it a go. So everything looks identical to how it did before. But now when it goes behind parts of the castle, it still shows up, which is really going to help the player to be able to control the ball to anticipate where it's going to end up, which is a really useful feature, I think. OK, so that's going to wrap this step up. We've now added a really useful feature. What we're going to do going forward is get these meshes to start destructing so that that's going to be something that we really need to do before we can add any more functionality because extra functionality might be going onto the wall and the towers, etc. So let's get the destructible mesh set up and then we can work towards finishing this project. So I'll see you in the next step where we'll start knocking walls down. Now it's time to start smashing this castle to pieces. And we're going to do that through the use of destructible meshes. Now it's possible to create all the different chunks that your mesh will be destroyed into in your 3D editor. But we're just going to do it in Unreal Engine because it's quicker and easier. So what we need to do is go into static meshes. And normally you would just right click and up here there would be the option to create a destructible mesh. But it's not yet showing because you have to turn on a plugin first. The plugin for that is not loaded by default. So the first thing we will do is turn that plugin on. So if we go to edit and then down to plugins, the name of the plugin we're looking for is Apex. So I'm not going to scroll through, I'll just search for it here. A-P-E-X. There it is and you can see it is not enabled. So we'll click on enable and then we need to restart the engine for that to take effect. So I'll do that now and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, my engine's just reopened. It's taken me back to the plugins window. So I'll just search for Apex again, make sure that that's worked. Yep, that's enabled. Brilliant. We can close this window now. And to double check that it's worked, I'll right click on this wall. And there it is, create destructible mesh. And I'm going to have all my destructible meshes just in the static mesh folder. So that'll work fine. So right click, create destructible mesh. Here it is. Now, the first thing we'll notice is that we can see our wall, but there are no materials on it. Now, the first thing I'll do is put the materials on so they can be compiling in the background. So you're looking for skeletal mesh and you've got zero and one. That's because this one has two different materials on it. So I'll drop these both down, zero and one. And then I think this one's got destructible one as that color. That looks okay. And then destructible two should be the lighter color. Yeah, that looks okay. So now I've got my materials on there. I can now start setting up the destructibleness of this. So I'm going to scroll back up to the top here and then change some of these settings. So I want to enable impact damage, which will help it to actually destruct. And then I'm going to set the impact damage to 100 and default impact damage depth to 100 as well. That'll make everything work the way I want it. And then I need to work out how many pieces I want it to break into. So 
I'm primarily aiming this at a mobile platform, so I don't want to give the physics engine too much to think about. So I'm going to drop the cell site down to 16. You might even get away with fewer than that. And then there's this random seed here, which will fracture it in different ways. But we'll just go for the default and see what it looks like. So once you've got those settings and you're happy with them, you can click up here to fracture your mesh. And you'll see it'll show you how it's broken. You can have a look around it. And what I like to do as well is use this slider to explode it. And you can see how the pieces are broken up. And actually, I'm really happy with that. So I'm going to keep that as it is. If you're not happy with it, put another number in there, fracture it again, and then you'll see what it looks like. And you might like that one better. But I'm happy with this, so I'm going to click on Save. Now we want to test this. So I'm just going to pop that over there. And I'm going to put some copies of this in the level. So I'm just going to put it over there. And what I don't want is for this to overlap with anything because that will set it off, which I don't want to happen. So I'm just going to make sure I've got some gaps. I'm going to put it all the way along here because I want the ball to be able to hit it. And as long as there are gaps, I'll be fine. There we go. So I'm going to give this a quick test, but I'm not going to get anywhere near the result I want yet. But just to show you where we are. So they sit there and I can hit them. But then when I do, they kind of wake up and just drop through the floor. And there are a couple of reasons that that's happening. But what we'll do first of all is sort out the, uh, the dropping through the floor, which is not good. Part of the reason I'm having that issue is that first of all, these are below the floor. So I'm going to move them all up and then I'm going to press end on my keyboard. And now they're no longer through the ground, but that's still not going to change anything. So when I hit one of them, it's still falling through the ground. That's because the ground has no collision box yet. So we need to add one. So let's open the ground up. And the easiest way to add one of these for this shape is go to collision. And we're going to add a box simplified collision. And then if we just make sure that we can see collision, so simple collisions on, you'll get a little outline on there indicating that that exists. So let's save it. And we'll play again. Now there's a chance that this won't drop through the floor. There we go. So once it's been hit, it will now land on the ground and it will fracture a little bit. So we're getting closer to what I'm looking for. What I'm going to do now, now that we've got a collision box, I should be able to put these on the ground because they're still hovering above it. So if I select them all and press end, that will drop them down to the next collidable surface. So now they're sitting perfectly on the ground. So let's press play again and see what happens when I hit them. They fracture. That's pretty nifty, right? So I'm not getting enough of a reaction out of them yet. I want them to be knocked down. And you can see the second time the ball goes through them, once they've been fractured, it can then just knock the crap out of them, which is good. But this indicates that our destructor mesh is working. We're just going to use a blueprint later to get a little bit more control over it. We're going to control what it will collide with, when it will collide. We're going to make it break up a little bit after it's been hit using an impulse. So there's going to be a lot more going on with it. But for now, we figured out how to make a destructible mesh and how to get it to interact with our ball. So I'm not going to do the other two. I think you can figure it out. So when I meet you in the next step, you should have the gate destructible mesh ready to go and also the tower destructible mesh ready to go, making three destructible meshes in total ready for getting the blueprint set up. So I will see your beautiful ass in the next step. At this stage then, you should now have created three different destructible meshes. One for the wall, one for the tower, and one for the gate. And as you can see, I've put them in my level just so that I can test them. I'll do this really quickly. So let's throw a ball at them and make sure that they actually are being destroyed. Got to get past the first few first. Yep, yeah, there we go. That's all working as expected. And yours should be too. But what we need to do now is make it so that the way that these destruct happens to this. So we're going to need to update our blueprints. But first of all, we need to get rid of all of these because we don't need them because they were just for testing purposes. So let's get rid of them like that. OK, so now it's time to go into our blueprints and update them. So let's go to content and back into our blueprints folder. And as I keep doing, I'm going to do it on the wall because I'll see the most impact with that. So let's open BP underscore block underscore wall. And this is what we've got so far. We're going to need to make a change here. So this is just the static mesh. We need to add a destructible mesh. So what I'm going to do is add a component and start typing destructible. And it will pop up. 
And there it is. So I'm just going to leave it called destructible because I'll know what that is. And then what I'm going to do is with this wall, I'm going to hide it. So let's just scroll down. I'm going to untick visible. And that is because when I load in this destructible, I need to see whether or not it actually loads in. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So I'm going to go to destructible mesh and I want the wall underscore DM. So I've selected it, but nothing has shown up here. And it should have. I've Googled this. Apparently it's a bug, although it's been a bug for as long as I can remember, so I'm starting to wonder if it's just the way things are. But to get your destructible mesh to show up, the best way to do it is just click on simulation, and then click it again to turn it off, and then it will show up. So I was just using the original wall as a placeholder, so now when I turn this on and off, I can see that they're in exactly the same place, which is what I wanted. So that means I can now delete this. I have no further use for it. So now we have our destructible wall in there instead. But at the moment, that's not going to generate any hit events with the ball because we haven't got the script set up for that. So let's set that up. So first job is to scroll down, or scroll up in this case. Where are we? I'm looking for a collision. Make sure that the simulate generates hit events, just like we did previously. Otherwise, when the ball hits it, nothing will happen. So we'll turn that on first of all. And then we'll go into our event graph. And this is mostly all right. It's just not using the right component. So it's on component hit wall. We need it on component hit destructible now. So let's right click here. We'll get an add event on component hit. There it is. And what we're going to do is just replace this. So I'm going to pop that in there and other actors are going to go in there. And then we can get rid of that. That's no longer needed. Now, we could leave it here, but we wouldn't see any of the fracturing because it would destroy the actor as soon as the ball hits it which completely negates the point of having destructible meshes. So what we'll do is give it a little delay so that we can see the, the destruction happening. So I'm going to just, after we've checked, is it the ball, we're going to add a delay of probably one and a half seconds, I think suits what I like. So it will be able to do a little bit of destruction before it's then destroyed. So let's compile that and we need to test. Oh dear. They've disappeared, and I've tested this a couple of times. This happens whenever I leave it in, but whenever I bring in a new version of it, it does behave. So what we're going to need to do is get rid of all the previous block walls, unfortunately. Again, if anybody knows a better way of doing this, then drop me a comment down below, because I'm not sure why that happens. But it just means that now we get this one. I'm going to press end to make sure it's sitting on the ground. So I'll bring it above the ground and press end. There you go. And then I'm going to drop this in place. And it's not going to be in line with the gate because that's currently above the ground. But that will be put on the ground when we update that blueprint as well. So what we need to do now is just create our copies and get all of this castle set up again. So I'll just do some editing wizardry and I'll see you when I've put all these walls back in place. And I'm back. Okay, so you can now see that I've replaced the original blueprints with exact copies of the same blueprint. And now the castle's put back together, and so we should now be able to use the destructibleness of these meshes to good effect. So let's do a quick test. So they won't destruct spectacularly yet, so you might just see that that one cracked a little bit. Uh, and they are also affecting each other. So you see now that a piece of wall next to that one has started to crumble, but then hasn't been destroyed yet because the ball hasn't hit it. So it's not perfect yet. We've also got some weird physics going on. Oh, it stopped the ball. Interesting. And that's because we're not quite there yet, but we are now much closer. So again, I'm going to leave you to do the updates on the towers and on the gate. So you're going to make sure that you update the blueprints to include the destructible mesh. You're also going to make sure you update the event graph. Don't forget to generate hit events, otherwise it won't work. And then I will meet you in the next step where we'll do a little bit more wizardry on these destructible meshes. Now you should have made sure that you've swapped in the new destructible mesh blueprints for all the pieces of the castle. So that means the wall, the tower, and the gate. And that will mean that everything now gets destroyed when the ball hits it, but it also gives us a bit of a problem. And I will show you what I mean before we move on. So if I just fire the ball into the level, it will hit one of the meshes, but then everything will crumble. And then the whole game will come to a crawl because there's too much physics simulation going on and it's not good. And that's because at the moment anything can cause these meshes to fracture, even 
pieces of other meshes around it. And we only want it to happen when the ball does it, so that we're getting a lot more control out of what we're doing. And that's what this step's gonna be all about. So let's jump into that. So we'll do this on the block wall blueprint, seeing as that's the one that I have the most pieces of. And the first thing I want to do is make sure that the gravity is set to off on my destructible mesh. We only want to turn things on as we need them. So you can see enable gravity is listed there. Let's turn that off. What you also want to do is make sure that simulate physics is in fact set to off because you're gonna get some weird results if you have it set to on by default. So we'll leave that set to off so we're getting exactly what we want. Now the way we're gonna stop this from fracturing when anything hits it is through the collision presets. And I will show you where that is. Here we go, collision presets. So if we just expand that a little bit, you can see you've got all this information. And at the moment it's blocking everything, which means anything can cause it to break. So what we'll do is we'll change this to custom. We're gonna put it on ignore but then only the bits that we want it to be affected by, we're gonna tell it to block. And then we're gonna tell it to only block the physics body, which is the ball. Since until the ball hits it, we don't want it to collide with anything. So it's only listening for collisions from the ball. That's the only thing it will be looking out for. That'll work nicely. And then what we wanna do is have certain things change once it has been fractured. So what we'll do is we'll get a new event and the event we'll get is on component fracture. So when this fractures, we're gonna have it do some stuff. So the first thing we'll do is once it is fractured, we're gonna turn the gravity on so that things will fall down. So we're gonna get the destructible. And for that, we need to enable gravity. So there we go, set enable gravity. So the first thing we'll do as soon as that is fractured is tick that box, enable gravity. So now things will fracture and then be dropped to the ground. So we'll just compile that for now. Once the mesh has already been fractured, then what we wanna do is tell it to ignore the ball. Otherwise, if the ball goes through the debris again, it can send it everywhere and it's gonna make it look too messy or too messy for my liking. So the next thing we'll do is once it's been hit by the ball once, we'll tell it to ignore it going forward. I'm gonna do that with a collision response node. So we'll go from here, um, set collision response to channel. And we're gonna do that for destructible. There we go. And what we're gonna do is on physics body, we're gonna tell it to ignore that. So now, once it's been destroyed, it's actually not going to respond to anything, really. But what I do now want this to respond to is other bits of destructible measures so the debris can kind of crumble off of each other. Otherwise, it'll all fall into itself, which we don't want. So we'll get another one of these, set collision response. And this time, we're gonna turn on destructible and we're going to tell it to block that so that's two out of three that we want to change and now we also want to tell it to block world static meshes so that it won't fall through the floor so we'll have one more of these there we go so world static and block so that now sorts out our collisions everything's going to be a lot more controlled because of this so let's just hit compile for that and now it's the moment of truth, we want to test this. So keep in mind that the towers and the gate aren't gonna behave themselves yet, but hopefully the walls will. So let's try and hit a wall. Yeah, so that wall went pretty nicely. So let's just hit a couple more. There we go, so that's hitting and it's fracturing and then it's disappearing after a certain amount of time but it's not affecting any of the other blocks around it which is what we want now what the, because we're being a lot more controlled is stopping the walls from crumbling spectacularly so what we need to do now is get them to destroy a little bit more flamboyantly so let's have a look at that so the way that we're going to get this to break up a little bit more is once that we have set all the collision things up, we're gonna add a radial impulse, which is kind of gonna spin things around, which will make it look a bit more spectacular when, when they break up. So we're going to go over here, I'm gonna do a radial impulse for the destructible, which makes sense. But we need to know where to add that impulse. And we need to add it kind of at the center of the wall, but up a little bit. So it's happening kind of in the middle. And I'll show you how to do that. For the destructible, we need to get the world location. Get world location, lovely. 
And what we want to do is use that return value in the origin, but we want to tweak it a little bit. So in order to tweak it, we're going to split this pin so that we get the X, Y, and Z values. And we need to just manipulate the Z value a little bit. So we'll split this one as well. And X and Y we're going to leave alone. So we'll just pop those in there. But we're going to add to the Z. So if we just pull out of here and we just put in a plus symbol there, we're going to do float plus float. And the result's going to go into Z. And what we're going to do is just add 50 onto this, which means that the impulse will happen 50 above the ground, which is what we're looking for. So that's pretty nice. That'll be the uh, radial impulse being added. So we'll have that happen after all of our collisions have been set up. So let's have a little look at that and see if this is now happening a little bit more beautifully. So we'll hit play. Hopefully we'll hit a bit of wall. So it's doing something, but it's not doing enough. So let's go back in and we've not really done the radius or strength. So we need to add something to that. So what I'm gonna do is put in some numbers that I've used before that I know that I like. So we'll set the radius to 40, which is the distance where this is gonna take hold. And then the strength, I'm gonna to set to 10,000. Okay, so let's compile again and let's see what we get this time. Hopefully slightly better destruction. Yeah, there we go. So now that wall, when it gets hit, is properly crumbling bringing down the castle. And now there's one more thing that I want to change because we've still got things crumbling when we don't want them to and not disappearing. So let's go back into here and we can actually now do away with the on hit because if it's being destroyed and it can only be destroyed by the ball, then we know that's gonna give us a hit as well. So I'm gonna get rid of that and all of this I want to happen after after this has gone so we're going to pop this at the end here so after we've done everything else let's add the delay so we can get rid of the ball because we know it must have been the ball because it's a physics object so we'll add a delay of 1.5 seconds and then destroy it so we'll give this one more go again we're only looking at the walls because the gate and the towers won't work yet so let's see what we get this time so it hits the wall so we know that the tower is still going to cause us some issues. So we'll ignore that for now. We're just focusing on the walls to make sure they do what we think they should. Everything's kind of now destroying. But I find that I get some strange physics on the wall pieces. Especially, it is all of them. But after they fall, it's as if they're being kind of pulled backwards and forwards. Which I will try and show you. There we go, it happened a little bit there on the left hand wall. I'm not really sure what causes that, but I do know what fixes it. So there's one last thing that we'll do before we move on. And that's to sort that out. So into the wall, here's our blueprint. And here we've got the default scene route and the destructible. And what I find fixes this problem is to make the destructible the scene route. Just like that, that's all you've got to do. So if we compile and save that, and then we'll test again. Now I'm expecting all the wall pieces to just behave themselves. So as the ball works its way around, nothing flies off too crazily. Everything just breaks. We've got that little radial impulse doing its thing. And everything looks pretty nice, pretty controlled, pretty tidy, which is what I'm going for. We'll leave that step there then. All you need to do now is go and make those same changes to the tower pieces and the gate piece. And then everything will just be working fine and dandy. It will be beautiful. Once you've done that, I will see you in the next step where we'll start setting up the stage clear behavior. So I'll see you in the next step for that. This step is going to be all about setting up a level clear behavior. So what we need to do is find a way to count all the blocks. And then when that reaches zero, we need to say to the player, well done, you've beat the level. So that's what we'll be doing now. The first thing we need to set up is a way of counting all the blocks in the level. Because they're different blueprints, so we've got one, two, three, four different types of blueprint that we need to be counting. The most straightforward way isn't just to count each type of those blueprint and add them up. We can do it in a different way. And the way I'm gonna do it is through the use of tags. So we can give each one of these blueprints a specific tag, which we'll call block. And then we can count everything with that tag. So that's what we'll do. We'll start with just doing it on the gate, first of all, so that then we only have to get rid of one block to beat the game and that'll make it easier and faster for testing. Once that's working, we'll push it out to all the other ones as well. 
So let's go into Blueprints and we're going to find BP Block Gate. There it is. And what we'll do is add this tag. So if we scroll down, you can see there's an Actor section here. And if we just expand the Advanced section, you'll see that there's a tag area here. We can go for plus and I'm just going to go for block all in lowercase. And that's all we need to do there. That's easy. So let's compile that and save it. What we need to do now is set up something that's going to count anything with this block. And we're going to do that in our game mode. So let's open that up. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a new custom event. And I'm going to call this blocks remaining check. So it's going to check how many blocks are remaining. It's a descriptive name. So the node that we're going to use is get all actors with tag. Here it is. And in here, we can input what tag we want to use. So I'm just going to type block. So the first thing that we want to do is get all of those actors. And what that gives us is an array, which is like a list of different things. So we could have it list all the different types of blueprint that have this tag, but we don't want it to list them. We just want it to count how many things are in that list. And in order to do that, we'll drag out of here and we'll type length. And that's just going to give us the length of that array, how many different items are in that array. And when we've got that information, we need to just turn that into a variable. So I'm going to right click on that, promote to variable, and I'm going to call that variable blocks remaining. So now we have a way of counting what blocks are left and putting that into a variable that we can use. Now what we're going to do is just check that that's doing something with a quick print string. So let's just go here. I'm going to do print string. Here we go. And what I want it to do is just print this. So that's just going to put on screen how many there are there. So at the moment, it's going to run on that, but we'll just do it on tick. So every tick, we're just going to run that just to make sure that it's working. So let's make sure we've got this all connected up properly. So there we go. Now we've got event tick into get all actors with tag set the variable and then we're just going to print it to screen so let's compile and save that and we'll just give it a quick test and straight away you can see that it's printing one on screen so there it is going down so every tick is printing that now we don't really want to do this every tick we just want to check that it is working so the idea is now that if i can hit the gate there we go that then goes down to zero so that's now counting perfectly nice so we can close that for now and we're also going to get rid of this tick because that served its purpose. And we're going to leave the print string in there for now, just so that we can check that it's working as it should. We'll get rid of that once we're happy that it is all working. So now, instead of running this check every tick, we need to find something a bit more appropriate that isn't going to be as intensive on the system. So we're going to do it every time the ball hits something. That's when we'll run the check, since it's going to be the ball that destroys them anyway. So every time the ball hits something, we'll run this check. How many blocks have we got left? So into the ball blueprint. We're going to create an on component hit event. So every time this hits something, that's when we're going to run this. And then we need to talk to the game mode so that we can do this check. So let's get the game mode. And then from the game mode, we want to run the blocks remaining check. There it is. So every time we get a hit on the ball, let's run that check. So now we'll test this again. And so now every time that the ball hits something, we should see the print string doing its thing. So when it hits this wall here, yep, it puts it up to one. And now that's only happening every time that we get a hit. Let's see if we can destroy that. So there we go. And now once that's destroyed, that goes down to zero. Perfect. So that's doing its job. So now whenever that blocks number reaches zero, we're going to need to run the level clear behavior. And before we can do that, we need to create the level clear behavior. So we're going to need to go back into the game mode for that. We'll create a new custom event. And we'll call that level clear. Beautiful. And we're also going to need a variable for this, a, a Boolean variable which is going to be called level clear, because it's a question. Level clear? There we go. 
So, we've now got our custom event and we also have our variable that we can set to true when our number of blocks gets to zero. So let's do that. So whenever we call level clear, the first thing we want to do is we're going to be setting level clear to true. That's the first thing we want to do. And then what we're going to do is just add a bit of a delay and then we're going to load a level. As I've not created any more levels yet, we're just going to reload level one. But if I was creating more of a game, I would create level two and we would load that one. So let's add a delay. And we'll put five seconds on that to give the level clear message a little bit of time to show. And then we're going to run open level. And I have the level written somewhere else. Yeah, it's level one with a capital L. So level one. Okay, and that's pretty much our behavior set up. So let's just comment these. Blocks remaining check. And this is going to be our level clear behavior. There we go. So now we need to do something to trigger this level clear. When is this going to run? Well, let's get rid of the print string for a minute. So we're just going to disconnect that. Let's drop it out there. So what we need to do now is create a branch. And this branch is going to fire if the blocks remaining is at zero or less than zero. So let's create a branch. Awesome. And the condition is going to be, is this less than or equal to zero? So there's our condition. And if it's true, we're going to run level clear. There we go. So that's what's going to have that working. Beautiful. And I think what we will also do is just put that print string back in for now, just in case we need to check anything. So I'm just going to drop this in here. And we'll get that. Okay, so that's all now doing its thing. Compile and save. So this should now work. Because we've only got one of these blocks, we should be able to just hit the gate and that should reload the game because that's going to be level clear. So let's give it a quick check. See if I can hit the gate first time. Oh, good shot. So that's now gone down to zero. There should be a five second delay and then it should, yep, yeah, then it reloaded the level. Brilliant. So we've got a bit of an issue in that the ball keeps moving after it registers zero. So what we're going to have to do is find a way of stopping the ball before we move on. Because we don't want the player to lose a life after they've got all the blocks. So to stop the ball, we'll go into the ball blueprint again. So it's happening on hit. So we're going to keep this as it is. And we're going to run a branch. And the branch is going to be is level clear true so let's get level clear there we go so we'll plop that into there and if level clear is true what we're going to do is get the ball speed in fact we're going to set the ball speed so what we'll do is we'll set that to zero and that will just stop it moving so there we go I'm just neaten that up a little bit awesome so let's try that one more time. Compile, save, and play. So now, hopefully, when I hit the gate, there we go, and it didn't work. Oh, there you go. It took a little minute, but it did stop. And that's just because it's waiting for the one and a half seconds while the wall crumbles. We could tighten that up a little bit, but I think it will serve our purpose, so I'm going to leave that as it is. So the last thing that we need to do is create a level clear message so we can display that to the player. And then that's going to be our level clear behavior all set up. So we'll just comment this first. And I'm just going to call this level clear. This is all to do with whether or not the level is clear. So that will do. And now we need to go into the heads up display. Here it is. And the first thing we'll do, the game over message is pretty much what we want, but we just need to change the wording and when it displays. So the first thing I'll do is just duplicate this. Awesome. 
and then we'll change the text to level, well, let's put it all in caps, level clear, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, number one, exclamation mark, smiley face. Yeah. Okay, and now we need to set up when should that display. And we're gonna go and find visibility. Here it is, and we add a binding to that. So create a binding, awesome. So we need to go to the game mode, and we're going to get the game mode. We also want to get level clear. So get level clear, and we need to know if that's equal to true. So let's get out of that, we'll put a couple of equals in. Is that equal to true? There we go. So that's our condition. And then we want to set the visibility. So from here, we're gonna get a select, same as we did on the previous message. And into our index, we're gonna get our condition. So if this is false, it's gonna be hidden. And if it ever becomes true, it will then become visible. So that should all work fine. So let's just compile that and save it. And now it's time for another test. So let's see if we can get this level clear message to display. So hit that, boom, wait one and a half seconds, and we cleared the level! Yes! Oh, this is an easy game, you just gotta hit the gate. Yeah, oh yeah, and then it resets. Oh, we've done it guys, we have set up the level clear behavior. The only thing that we need to do now is add the block tag to all the other blocky things. So, let's do that. So let's go to, what we got? We've done gate, we need to add it to the block. So let's find tags and add block. Nope, I don't want it in caps. There we go, compile, save. And then we're gonna do tower. So there we go, add VLOCK. And I think I maybe need to do one more. Oh, no, I don't wanna play yet, save. We need to do the wall, that's it. So, drop that down, add a tag, the tag is block. And then, we compile, and we save, and we test. Okay, so this time I don't wanna hit the gate straight away, although I probably will. So now we have 45 blocks showing, which is good. So what I'm gonna do now is cut because you're not going to watch me playing all this, it's boring, until I've just got one block left, and then I'll come back and start talking, and we'll make sure that level clear works with everything in place. Here we go, and bosh. Last one's gone, level clear pops up, ball stopped, and reset. Hey, there we go, everyone. So, we now have the level clear behavior set up. Wonderful. So, in the next step, we're gonna be looking at adding some audio to this to make it feel a little more interesting to play, to give the player a bit more feedback as well about when the hits are happening and when things have been destroyed. And also, a happy little sound when they win, I think. So, see you in the next step for that. Now that we've got our game over behavior set up, let's go about adding some sound to the game to make it feel a bit richer and a bit more complete. So, if you want to use my assets, then that will be in the audio folder of the assets download. And the first thing we need to do with those is get them imported. So what I'll do first of all is create a folder for them. And I'm just gonna call that folder audio, which seems like a pretty good name. There we go. And then I'll go into that folder and we are going to import to that. So here's the breakout folder that I've shared if you have got access to that via the link down below. And then into the assets folder, there's an audio folder. And these are the sounds. I've got them from this website. It's a free 8-bit sound effect website. But I did need to change the bit rate on some of them to make them work. So not all of the sounds on that website just work out of the box. Anyway, let's um, import these ones. And then they appear in the folder. And then you can play them by just doing this. So... I've just got it coming through the speakers. I don't know how well you'll be able to hear the sounds. That's nice, so that's game over. We'll have hit and level clear. So that's all our sounds. What we need to do now 
is set up when and where we want these sounds to appear. So the first thing we're going to do is make it so that these castle blocks make a, a nice demolishing -y noise when the ball hits them. So for that we're going to go into the blueprint. We'll do the BP underscore block underscore wall first because that's got the most impact. So here's our script so far and what I want to do is just put this audio in before the delay. It has to be before the delay otherwise it will wait one and a half seconds before playing the sound. So it's really really easy to do. What we do is we drag out of here just to put it in, in between the radio impulse and the delay. I'm going to do a play sound and it's the play sound 2D that we're looking for and that'll just drop that in there and you can choose your asset from here and all the sounds that we've imported will now appear and we're going to use the crumble sound and then we'll just compile and save and we'll just press play and we'll test we'll hit a castle wall just to make sure that that is in fact working yeah lovely so that's that one done what we need to do now is the same for the castle tower and the castle gate but i'm not going to show you that because it's exactly the same process so i'll do it myself and i'll cut that out so that it's done when i test the game but i'm going to let you do that one on your own just put the play 2d sound in it's the same sound effect you'll be fine okay so i've just completed that so here it is on the wall straight after the impulse same on the gate impulse play sound delay and then on the tower impulse play sound delay nice and easy what we'll do next is the sound for the little breakout style blocks inside the castle. We've got a different sound for those, so we'll put those on now. So let's find our block blueprint. There it is. And for this one, because there are no delays, we can just put the sound at the end. So what we'll do is do a play sound 2D. And this one's going to be the collectible sound, which makes a nice, pleasant noise. So we'll compile and save that. And then it's now time for a quick test just to make sure that all the sounds are doing what we think they should. So the crumble sound's working okay. It's working on the towers as well. And there we go. Oh, <laughs> carnage. Yep, so that's all working fine. So far, so good. What we need to do now is add a sound that will play when the ball hits the cliff, so the, the edge of the game world, the bounds. And we're going to have to handle that in a slightly different way because we're going to add that to the ball but we don't want that sound to play every time the ball hits something, only when it hits the cliffs. So we have to do that slightly differently, but it's still very straightforward. So let's open the ball blueprint first of all. There we go. We're going to attach this sound to the on component hit. So it's just going to change the way that we've got this laid out a little bit. So I'm going to move all of this along a little bit. And we're just going to change that because that's what handles the level clear. This bit here is just going to be what handles playing the sound. So because we only want this to happen when the ball hits a static mesh, which is the case, what we'll do is on hit, we're going to do a check. So we'll cast to static mesh. So what we're doing now is the first thing is we'll check, did the ball hit a static mesh actor? And the only static mesh actors in the scene that it can hit are the cliffs. So we'll do that check, and if that comes out as true, then we'll play the sound. If, however, it comes out as false, if it fails, we just go on with the script, and we do the blocks remaining check. But if it is, in fact, the ball hitting the static mesh, we're going to do our play sound 2D. There we go. And we will select the asset to use, which is just going to be hit, and we'll connect that up as well. And I'm just going to put some reroute nodes in here so I can see what I'm doing. Drop that down there and drop that down there. There we go. So this is a little check. Did it hit a static mesh actor? If it did, we'll play the sound. If it didn't, don't play the sound, but keep doing the same thing. So let's compile, save, and we'll give that a little test as well, just to make sure that it's playing the sound when it hits the side, but not when it hits anything else. Yep, yeah, that's pretty good. Yep, it's not doing it when it hits the paddle. That's working as intended. We'll now do something similar for the paddle. When the ball hits the paddle, we want that same sound, but we'll handle that slightly differently and we'll do it on the paddle. So let's go into that blueprint. There it is. And we're going to do an on component hit for this one, which I don't believe we have in here yet. So let's do on component hit. Here it is. 
and we want to check did this hit the ball so for other actor we're just going to cast to to ball cast a bp ball and if it's the ball that hits it we're going to play our sound play sound and the asset's going to be hit and that means that if it's not the ball so if it hits the side um which it might do when we're moving side to side we don't want that sound to play because that will be distracting it's only going to happen when the ball hits it but that's something else we're going to need to check so let's make sure that that's behaving as we think it should so we're just now listening for when the ball hits the paddle do we still get that sound come on baby no and there is a very good reason we didn't get that sound and i'm going to fix it now i should have remembered but i didn't so into the paddle the problem is we're not generating hit events so that hit didn't register let's tick that compile save let's try that again so this time we'll make a sound when we hit the paddle here we go <laughs> yeah okay so that's pretty much all the collision sounds in place and it's already feeling a lot more dynamic if not a little louder so what we need to do now is add some little jingles that will play when the player either loses a life or clears the level both of those are going to happen in the game mode so let's now open our game mode and we'll do the level clear first because that's nice and easy so it needs to happen before the delay Otherwise, it'll wait five seconds and then play the sound. So we need to make a little bit more room in here. So let's move these along a little bit. And then just here, we'll have a play sound. Awesome. And the sound that we want to play is level clear. And it's that easy. So we'll compile that. And we also want to do one on game over. So again, this needs to happen before the delay. So we'll move these along a little bit. Let's add our play sound. And this time it's gonna be the game over sound. Okay, so that now is everything set up. So what we need to do now is test that the two end jingles are working. And if that's working, we'll move on to the next step. So let's compile, save and play. So the first thing I'm going to do is test the game over sound because that's the easiest to get to. I just have to let the balls fall. So here we are, about to lose the last life. And... Beautiful. Okay, now what I'm going to have to do is play this game for a little bit. We'll get to the point where we're about to get level clear and then I'll come back and we'll see if that music plays. There we go. Hey, there we go. So now we have all the audio in our game set up and working as intended. So that brings us to the end of this step. In the next step, we're gonna do a little bit more work on the visuals. I want a bit more of a pixelated, old school 8-bit look to this game. So we'll implement that next. Now we've got the audio set up and working as we want it to. The next thing I want to do is have one more look at the visuals just to get the overall look that I'm going for. As with the sound, I'm going for a retro aesthetic. So what I want to do is get it to look nice and pixelated, big chunky pixels. And I'll show you how I'm going to achieve that. So the best way to do that is if I just play the game first of all. And you can see that's kind of it by default, but we're going to use some console commands to manipulate the way it's rendering. So the first thing I'm going to do is do r.screen percentage and you can see it comes up there as a suggestion, so I just press tab to get that. And then I'm gonna drop the screen percentage down to 40%, which means it will render at 40% of the resolution available to it. But the downside to this is it's not yet giving me that chunky pixelated look that I want, because it's trying to smooth it out. So we need to turn that smoothing off. And that's another console command. So it's gonna be R dot upscale quality. So there's the upscale quality there. I'm gonna set this to zero to turn it off. And that's it. That gives us our chunky, pixelated look. That's brilliant. Let's just check how it looks when it knocks things down. Oh my god, it looks so good! So that actually is probably a little bit too chunky for me with the size of the pixels. So what I'm going to do is just turn the screen percentage up a little bit. So r.screen percentage. Let's try 50%. 
Yeah, so then we don't lose as much detail, but it gives us a nice old school aesthetic. So, now that I know what I want, I need to make sure that it remembers this. So if I just quit the game and do that again, it remembers it in here, and that's fine, but it won't remember it in the standalone game. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So if instead of just going to play, I go to standalone game, this will take a little minute to open, but then you'll see that instead of respecting those settings I just put in, it does its own thing. There you go, so it's just turned everything up to max, which is fine, but it's not actually what I want. So we need to make sure that it knows that when we're in the actual game, that what we want to do is keep those settings. And we're gonna do that in the level blueprint. So we need to open the level blueprint. So let's go up here to blueprint and open the level blueprint. Here we go, and we've not done anything with this yet, but what we'll do is come out of begin play and we're gonna do execute console command. There it is. And what we do is just type in the console command that we want and it will carry that out when the level opens. So it's gonna be r.screen percentage and then we're gonna do a space and set that to 50. And then we'll do another one of these And this one's going to be r.upscale.quality space zero. And that should do it. That should then mean that these settings happen every time we play the game. But let's not leave it to chance. Let's compile, save, and we'll play a standalone game again to make sure that that's working as expected. Here we go then. That's just opened up and we have chunky pixels. So that's the first part of the visual tweaking done. The next part is I just want to work on the colours a little bit because it looks quite dull and a little bit lifeless. And also, for me, the shadows are a little bit too dark and it just doesn't work for me. So we'll improve that a little bit now. The way I'm going to go about this, we'll just close the level blueprint for now. I'm going to do it in the shader. So let's go to materials and the colour palette, M underscore palette. What we're going to do is just boost the emissive strength. So I'll show you that happening. So we'll set that to 0.4 and then we'll save this and that should then be reflected in game. And there we go, everything just got a whole lot lighter. It looks a little bit more pastely, but more importantly, the shadows now aren't quite as dark. So that's cool. But now the castle kind of stands out. It doesn't look like the rest of the game. So we need to repeat this for that shader. So if we go to M underscore destructible, here it is. I'll just make sure that we can see that change. So we have the same emissive property here, so let's change that to 0 0.4 to match. We'll hit save, and then this castle will look like the rest of the game. There we go then, that now got a lot brighter and looks much nicer. I'll let you decide whether or not you want to increase the emissive value on these blocks inside. I'm gonna leave them, I think they look okay. The next thing I want to do though, is try and bring some of the color back, because whilst I do like raising the brightness of the material, it does wash the colours out a little bit. So to bring those back, we'll use a post-processing volume. So if we just go in classes and search for post, that will pop up. I'm just going to drag it into the middle so I can find it. And then in the details for it, I'm just going to search for infinite. And then tick for infinite extent, which means that will happen everywhere. Then I'll search for saturation, which is how colourful things are. I'll put a tick in the box to say that we want to use it. And then this value here will control the saturation for all colors at once. So I'm just going to pull that up so you see that brings the green back in. So I want it to look nice and colorful. Something like 1.2 I think I like. So I'm just going to type that in. 1.2. Yeah, much better. And if you want to see what effect that's having, you can use that to toggle it on and off. So it just brings the colors back in a little bit. So I'm happy with that. The next thing I don't like, if we just go into the game again is we have the arrow, which is still attached to the ball, and we also have the, the kill zone being shown. So we're gonna get rid of both of those. So we'll go into the ball blueprint to get rid of the arrow. So blueprints, ball, no, nope, it's not in there. It's in the player paddle, isn't it? There we go, so there's the arrow, and we want that to be hidden in game. Compile and save. We're also gonna do that for the kill zone. There it is. So there's our box, and we'll have that be hidden in game. Compile, save. I want to get rid of the print string as well because I don't want the number of blocks remaining to be printed to screen anymore. So that's happening in the game mode. 
So here's the print string here. So you could just disconnect it in case you ever want to bring it back, but I don't. So I'm just going to delete like so, and then we'll just connect that up like that. And then we'll compile and save. So let's have another look at this now. That is looking much, much cleaner. We can launch the ball. It's doing beautiful things. Yep. And one last thing that I want to change. I'm no longer happy with the size of the ball. I want it to be bigger. I want to make some kind of joke about big balls now, but I'm not going to. I'm too mature for that. So what we'll do is go into BP underscore ball. So the size of this is just set to 1. And what I'll do is I just want to up it to 1.5. There's a couple of reasons for this. One, it will make the ball easier to see. And two, it will mean that it hits the blocks. Because I'm finding that I'm not hitting the blocks often enough. So this is going to make it hit them more often. So we'll compile and save that. And if we just go into the viewport, what I want to show you is that when we select the see-through ball, that still it sizes in relation to the ball. So when we made the ball bigger, the see-through ball got bigger as well because you can see there's a hierarchy there. So we don't need to worry about changing that. So now let's have a look at the size of the ball in relation to everything else. Yeah, that's better. So it doesn't look huge, but it'll just mean that it's easier to see for the player and also it's going to hit the blocks more often as well. It won't miss them. So that's pretty good. So that brings us to the end of another step. Well done. What we'll do next is we'll implement the touchscreen controls, which is the last time that we're going to get really complicated in this tutorial. So don't worry about it. And it's an optional step as well. You don't have to implement the touch controls, but if you've come this far, you probably want to. So I'll see you in the next step where we'll do some touching up. Now it's time then to get some touchscreen controls implemented in this game. We did say way back at the beginning that we were aiming this at a mobile platform, so we're going to need to be able to control it in some way on screen. So let's get that set up. So the only thing we'll be controlling is the position of the paddle, so it makes sense that the controls to that are going to go in the paddle blueprint. Here we are. First of all, we'll just put this in a comment to neaten it up. So play sound, and then we'll just swish that over there. And then down here is where we're going to put the touchscreen controls. So the trigger for this is going to be touch. There we go. So that's a good place to start. Now we're only interested in the side to side. So we can get where the screen was touched and it gives us that in X and Y coordinates. But as we're only moving side to side, we only need the X coordinate. So what I'll do is split this pin. And that means that I can just work with the location X, which is all I need. And then we need to convert this from screen space to world space so that we can apply it to the paddle, which is operating in world space. So out of here, we're going to go convert screen. We'll just turn off context sensitive for this. Screen location to world space. This is the node we want. And you can see that's now going to screen X. And the target for this is the player controller. So we'll do get player controller. There we go. And we'll just put that there out of the way for now. And then what I want to do is put that onto the paddle. So we need to get the position of the paddle. So let's get paddle. And from that, we're going to set the world location. There we go. And then what we can do is whenever this is pressed or released, or moved. We basically want this to be updating constantly whenever the player touches the screen. I'm just going to move this down here a little bit so I can see my wires. Try and neaten this up a touch. So whenever that happens, we're going to set the world location and we need to get the new location. So we'll split that pin and we'll split this pin because we just want world location X to become new location. And that, in a nutshell, is how we do it. But we're not finished yet because it won't really work. I will show you where we're at at the moment. So let's compile that and save. And what we need to do for testing purposes is make mouse clicks behave as touch. And we will do that by going into the project settings. Or is it the editor settings? Let's try project settings first. Yeah. So what we're going to do is use mouse for touch. Tick. And then the default touch interface we're actually going to turn off 
So we'll just clear that because we don't want that to show up. And then that's good. And now when I test, if I click, it will behave as a touchscreen. But you can see, it just can't move it far enough. So what we're going to need to do is multiply the values coming out of the screen space by a bigger number to get that paddle to move further because it's just not moving far enough at the moment. So back into here and this value then we are going to multiply. So we're going to float multiplied by a float and then that result's going to go into there. And just to get started, I'm going to try multiplying it by 100 and then we'll test it, see if we're any closer. So let's compile, play, and I'm playing it in this window because it will keep my mouse showing. And so I can see if my mouse goes further than my paddle, which it is doing, I know that I need to multiply that by a bigger number. There is probably a way of working out what this needs to be exactly. If anybody knows that, feel free to drop a comment down below. But I'll be honest, I just arrive at this through trial and error. That's probably not the best way, but it works for me. Right, so I actually have already done this. So I know that the number I want is 140. Brilliant. So we'll compile that and play. And then you can see now the paddle is following the mouse pretty perfectly. But it does introduce a new problem. I will show you what that is. If I now drag too far, it's destroyed the paddle because we've hit the kill zone. So that creates a problem for us. We don't really want that problem, do we? So let's hit escape. And you'll see it, oh, it will complain at me. Like, oh no, it's not working because you destroyed the paddle. That's right. So we need to find a way of stopping the player from being able to do that. And we're going to clamp the values so that it can't go too far left or right. But first of all, we need to find out what the bounds are, how far the player can get. And we'll do that just by doing a quick print string. So let's get the paddle. And we need to get the world location of that. World location. And with that world location, we just want to do a print string. There we go. And that's going to be what prints to screen. And the trigger for that, we're just going to do it on every tick. Because we, we're only going to use this for a second. So event tick. So every tick it's going to print this to screen so compile and let's play so you can see we've got x and y and z showing and the y and z i'm also going to use in a minute but the x i'm interested in so with my arrow controls i'm just going to go as far as it will let me and i can see that at the full extent it's going slightly above 600 or negative 600 and then to the other way it's going slightly above 600 so they're going to be my clamp values and then i remember that y and z are also set to one so let's go back into here so we're going to clamp this value so clamp float the return value of that's going to be what goes into there so the minimum value is going to be negative 600 i think and the max value is going to be 600 which is what we just found out and we also learned that the new location of Y can stay at zero, but Z should be set to one because that's where our paddle was previously. So that now is all looking pretty darn good. Let's give it another try. So compile and play. So now when I go left and right, I can no longer get to destroy the paddle. So that touchscreen's working pretty well. You can see that the arrow stays at the center of the paddle all the way across. So that's pretty good. So now if I put this into the level and it works anywhere along the screen as well, I can now play a little bit of on-screen breakout. Oh, lovely. Well done. Woohoo! Awesome. So let's come out of there. We can kill that print string. That's done its job. Thank you, print string. I'll miss you. And we'll compile and save again. Let's comment this because we're done with it. And we'll call this touch controls. Lovely. And now there's one more thing that I want to have happen. And that's to launch the ball. Instead of having to press a keyboard, because that's not what we're going to have on a phone screen. We're going to do it with a flick gesture. And the first thing we need to do is go back into our project settings for this. So window, no, edit, 
project settings and we're going to search for gesture and there we're looking for this enable gesture recognizer tick that box and now we can go back into our BP player paddle and we're looking for where we fire the ball and we're going to add a flick and whenever that's pressed we're just going to do the same thing as whenever we do the input action fire so I'll just place that there so they're now doing the same thing let's give that a test compile save and we will play so there we go I'm moving side to side and then if I to do a flick what I'm gonna do is press move the mouse up and then let go but I have to do it a bit quicker than that so let's flick like that and you can see that now releases the ball as well we've now implemented touch controls well done everyone now these can be a little bit tricky to test but if you have a touchscreen display that makes it much easier I happen to have an app on my phone let's turn that off I happen to have an app on my phone that will turn it into a touchscreen display so I will just show you now how this works so I'll set the game playing in a window move it over to that display and try and film how that works with the touchscreen okay so here's the game now running on my makeshift touchscreen display which is my phone so the frame rate's a little bit low just because it is an app running rather than an actual display but if I now just touch that you can see that that is working we're going side to side and if I do the flick gesture that sets the ball off on its way and we can touch kind of anywhere and try and play the game oh hey what a shot so there we go we can see that that's working just fine so you can see that's all working fine and we've set up everything that we wanted to get set up so that brings us to the end of this final step well done for making it all the way through and that's it you have made it to the end well done for sticking it out for so long I realize this is a very long tutorial but you've learned loads from following it through from the beginning right through to the end so congratulations this whole tutorial series has been a bit of a labor of love so it probably took me about a year to create it from beginning to write the exercises through to recording it all and editing it took a hell of a long time so if you appreciate all of that work then please hit the like button, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell, and leave me a happy comment down below. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my patrons, whose continued support really helps me to continue to make videos like this. If you're interested in becoming a patron and helping me to continue to grow the channel and put more tutorials out there, then follow the link in the video description to be taken to my Patreon page. There's obviously a limited amount of information that I can cover in a tutorial video like this, and if you want to continue learning beyond what I've covered, then I recommend you check out the courses over at Pluralsight. They've got loads of courses, lots to learn relating to Unreal Engine 4 and game development in general. And I took a few of the courses on Pluralsight when Unreal Engine 4 was still new to me so that I could figure the engine out. If you're looking for a recommendation, then I think you should take a look at Unreal Engine 4 Blueprint Fundamentals by Rob Brooks. It's a really good course and it helps you to get a better handle on the functions of different blueprints. That's well, well, well worth a look. If you use my link down below in the video description, you'll also get a 10 day free trial to Plural Site. So it basically means that you can take that tutorial or any others for free for 10 days. So I would say that's a bit of a no brainer. Free learning, why not? And so this really now kind of brings us to the end of the video. If you want to join the Game Dev Academy community though, you can join us through Discord. The link for that is below. You'll go through a little bit of a quiz first, which is our sorting ceremony, just like with the Harry Potter, and it'll put you into one of the houses, House Carmack, House Amano, or House Miyamoto. And then you can come, talk to other similar people, ask for help, share ideas. It's a lovely little community that's continuing to grow all the time. Anyway, thank you for watching this video. Please share it around if you can, or just watch it again. YouTube loves watch time, so you know, just let it run again. It's, it'll really help me out. But shh, don't tell anyone. But seriously, thank you for watching. Thank you for your support, and I hope to see you again in a future video. I believe that quality education should be available to everybody, and for that reason, all of the classes at Game Dev Academy are completely free, and we're supported by our very generous school governors over at Patreon. If you'd like to become a Game Dev Academy Governor and support our work as well as helping us to steer the channel in the right direction, then use the link in the description to be taken to the Patreon page.